Today, our first speaker, Dr. V. Mangai Karasi, ma'am, Professor and Head of Department of Microbiology, Faculty in Charge of Academics in Ames, Madurai. Ma'am has completed her grads undergraduation MBBS in Coimbatore Medical College and post-graduation MD Microbiology in Stanley Medical College. She has also completed PhD at SRM University, Chennai in the year 2012, titled Molecular and Zero Epidemiological Typing of Waterborne Pathogens, Toxin Producing E. coli and Rotavirus in Children and a degree in Advanced Course of Medical Education, the third MCI Fellowship in Medical Education. Ma'am has 23 years of teaching experience comprising MBBS, BDS, MD, MSc, PhD and other postgraduate programs. She has also published 23 research papers in a reputed international and national journals, written 9 manuals and standard operating procedures, 12 scientific articles in Tamil regional language. Ma'am, may I request you to enlighten us with the quality practices in mycobacteriology and mycology. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, on and all uh, present here. Uh, I, first of all, I thank uh, for uh, organizing team for giving the opportunity to talk on uh, the in the conference best practices of quality in diagnostic mic uh, microbiology so my talk is on the best practices the quality practices in mycobacteriology and mycology so before that uh, I, I am going to speak in three uh, no different areas so the one uh, first one is the already i shared uh, the worksheets no worksheets some of the questions to get the preliminary knowledge about the because the mycobacteriology the mycobacteriology and mycology both are a national program especially the mycobacteriology the national uh, tb elimination program that's the uh, previously called rntcp revised national tuberculosis control program so the two topics are very huge topic and it is very complicated and both are, uh, no, the pathogens of airborne pathogen. So the quality control, uh, it, it, it will be in the high standard. So it is very, very difficult to complete within the one hour. But I just uh, touch uh, what are the salient things to, you know, see for the low risk laboratory. Because I discussed with the um, head of the department, uh, Dr. Chitra, Chitra Rajalakshmi, then she told that it is a low risk um, mycobacteriology lab which is having the microscopy sputum microscopy and cb net also so this is the low risk uh, laboratory high risk laboratory actually you know uh, the culture and the molecular diagnosis pcr so those things then uh, very high risk laboratory is having the drug susceptibility testing also uh, apart from microscopy culture drug susceptibility so this various uh, uh, laboratories are there so we have to so the quality control on uh, the quality assurance program for each laboratory vary from uh, one laboratory to other but very 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 important for many of the you know the private sectors this is the private sectors uh, uh, actually the private sectors a contribution to the national programs are very very important because the 60 percent 80 percent of the you know uh, percent of the private sectors are in our country the 60 percent income is from private sectors only so the government concentrating the private sectors to control the uh, upcoming infections and the you know eliminating the tb and even now uh, the icmr is focusing on uh, fungal diseases so these both are the surveillance programs are so there uh, so it is very very important so three divisions first of all you must know uh, some preliminary knowledge about the mycobacteriology the national tb elimination program and also the mycology that is the first uh, part the second part a small uh, ppt in that ppt i am going to cover I cannot cover no, all the three laboratory and the various uh, validity and the uh, quality assurance uh, details. But on the whole, it will fit. The, if it fit into the low risk laboratory, the quality insurance uh, assurance, the same will be applicable to the uh, moderate risk and high risk laboratory. So I think, I hope I will cover uh, the quality assurance uh, for the low risk. It will fit into other things also. Then the third one is the, I am going to show you a quiz 
uh, pictures you have to identify the pictures and you have to share uh, the um, discuss or explain about the picture and what is the quality everything so this is how i am going to take this session today so shall i ask some of the things and the participants can answer uh, before going so our first question we will go what is india's national strategic plan for tuberculosis elimination because it is very very important one of the strategic plan is the quality quality you uh, know identification on the treatment on the prevention in that the quality is very very important so uh, can anyone tell participant actually it needs lot of uh, time to prepare the answers for everything but okay otherwise go to the fifth question describe cascade of care what is cascade of care okay uh, we're all coming from the trichy sra medical college post graduates la okay okay what are okay what wherever the lab no problem no problem what are the general concepts followed in your mycobacteriology laboratory can anyone share what are the general concepts of mycobacteriology laboratory in your lab Ah uh, yeah. Okay. 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 How are you measuring the quality uh, assurance program for your laboratory? How how you are processing the quality assurance? Or the quality control program for your laboratory, mycobacteriology laboratory, in your uh, hospital. What is the uh, institution name? Huh? Okay. What about the I I was? Ah. How you are uh, doing that? Okay. Uh, 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 your lab is participating in any proficiency testing. What is the proficiency testings you are following? Postgraduate students. Uh, okay. Okay then. So, can you tell about the no uh, the key components of CBNET at least? CBNET. No, uh, I just uh, change the question. Whenever you you are having the CB net, CB net in your laboratory, so you are receiving the kit. So how will you, you know check the kit? What is the checklist you are having to check the uh, kit provided by the manufacturer or uh, the national program? For an example, Nikshay Nikshay is supporting uh, all the laboratories. They are giving the logistic. For conducting CB net and for the sputum microscopy, how do you check or do you have checklist to verify the you know the components which they are providing or the materials they are providing for the particular test CB net or the sputum microscopy? Okay, you just tell you are getting the kit from the manufacturer. How will you verify the kit? Okay. Lot numbers, okay? Then just uh, I am asking technically also because we are all microbiologists. You can tell technically also. Okay, okay. Control whether control or there or not. Okay, then okay. So the postgraduates needs, you know, um, uh, on-site program-based training in the particular laboratory. So this is how I understood. All the project pro uh, postgraduates must be involved in the diagnostic section. We call it as the program-based uh, training. So program-based teaching, teaching and learning. So program-based teaching and learning, we can take the students uh, to the particular site, program site, program site. Uh, 
take them to the you know respiratory unit how they are collecting detecting the cases and then take them to the microbiology how they are collecting the sputum sample and how they are instructing and how they are uh, doing the manto test after that how they are doing the sputum microscopy there directly we have to involve the uh, pgs this we can do it for the even undergraduate students this is called the program based training this is how we are doing i have published on paper also how we have to do a program based training for tb uh, i'll give you if you go uh, no the website uh, my uh, biodata that paper is there if you click that program based teaching learning for the tb okay for undergraduate M mbbs students so it is available all the material supportive materials everything is there okay so i think uh, you just take this uh, handout and you try to answer everything try to find the answer on our website from the website from the niksha ntep mod modules are available training modules are available national tb elimination program modules are available uh teaching uh, modules are available the training modules for technicians and for the experts also available so you can verify and answer all so directly now i am going to my ppt because i thought we can discuss uh, everything but anyway you i'll give some time to prepare uh, then later also we can discuss at uh, one uh, no uh, in some other time so we will go for the uh, ppt presentation next slide please so uh, the both the laboratory though i am going to cover the mycobacteriology laboratory the quality uh, practices in uh, mycobacteriology laboratory and in the mycology laboratory almost it fit into mycology also but in certain uh, aspects it will vary uh, the drug susceptibility testing and the staining from staining to drug susceptibility uh, testing procedures will be vary but the uh, overall quality control for both the laboratories are same because both the laboratory the uh, safety um, biosafety cabinet is class 2 okay so this is how it will fit so i will just cover all these things so we are going to the quality assurance program contains the quality control quality improvement and proficiency testing so one of the proficiency testing that uh, no you have to give or the uh, supervisor have to give some slides to the technicians without telling them that it is a uh, this is for proficiency testing simply you can give the ordinary patient sample to the technicians even to the postgraduate students to do the test uh, yesterday also dr benai uh, explained about the proficiency testing same thing you follow the get the result and you assess from the beginning to end from how they are uh, pro, no processing for the smear how they are doing and the first put a microscopy and reading how they are reading and finally how they are reporting everything will be uh, assessed and you can uh, note it down okay this is the proficiency testing okay so the self assessment so each laboratory needs a self assessment if you are running the uh, uh, self assessment you can give at each stage if you have any doubt doing the uh, staining procedure if you have any doubt that you find that the quality of the stain is not good then immediately you can uh, test with the known positive samples and known negative samples okay and then you can mark it this is how the self assessment is very very important and opportunity for only to review your procedure so on and off review for the uh, steps involved in all the mycobacteriology and mycology are very important next slide please so the general assessment how the mycobacteriology and mycology labs they will assess so who will assess the uh, no the assessment tool the assessment tool uh, is having all these things so who will assess this definitely the national no accreditation um, you you have to get the national board accreditation so the people who are coming for assessing your lab they will check all these things okay and uh, for an example mycobacteriology uh, you are involving in the national surveillance program the supervisors of the other laboratory the national program the state level laboratory the reference laboratory who are connecting to that particular laboratory they'll come and check so they will check these tools okay uh, generally the safety measures are correct or not you are having an appropriate uh, class to be a biosafety cabinet or not 
you are following a appropriate protective agency uh, personal protective uh, equipments for the technicians and others are appropriate or not they are having a checklist for everything and how you are collecting the samples general concepts of collecting they'll go to the sample collection area they will assess there okay and the smear the quality of the smear they will assess and they will stain it and again they will read it and they'll compare the results of the technicians or uh, you know the um, young microbiologist who reporting or the even the pg students they'll involve for the staining so that they will uh, the supervisor will so the two experts will uh, no again review and they will give the result and finally you have to compare the both results and that is the review we call so this is the one of the assessment tool and inoculation if you are having the next level laboratory of culture and other things they'll check for the media quality they'll check for the media quality and they'll ask you Uh, at what interval you have done the media quality whenever you do a lot of uh, a particular batches of media for that batches of the media did you uh, put that control and what is that control result take your register and show the register this is how they will assess your uh, media preparation everything no media preparation and culture they will assess everything so everything in the inoculation and inoculum uh, standard inoculum equivalent standard or whatever the standard whether it is appropriate or not your inoculum how do you are assessing the inoculum standard the machine the uh, service providers or for mycobacterium tuberculosis they are giving the b2 because b2 is very complicated it will be used by the higher reference laboratory so a2 class 2 a2 is preferable for both mycology and for mycobacterium next next slide otherwise can i move here oh. the so overall objective for the laboratory no the quality previous one okay so the overall uh, the uh, test no e cost you whether the, your lab is participated in the proficiency testing and internal quality apart from that e cost so e cost register must be ready and the you no know, the utility uh, ultimately the e cost specimen must be treated as the patient samples already i explained about that e cost and the proficiency testing so how they are following next this is the objective of the quality laboratory practice in tb now i am going to discuss about the tb this uh, strictly they will uh, know the fix the elimination program according to that uh, elimination program uh, these all the the highlighted things no laboratory testing programs they will assess and the turn around time very important to notify is the turn around time okay yesterday they yesterday they showed the uh mock drill or you uh, know the um, uh mock uh how they are making the turn around time is disturbing that is very good uh, example for that and the safe work whether you are doing the safe work or not to prevent the airborne infections of my mycology and mycobacteriology next so the uh, uh, just this is for to understand the various laboratory i told 
definitely you will have the you are in the db unit of dmc means direct you uh, know the microscopy uh, this is the uh, cb net okay so the microscopy center in the cb net some laboratory will have the cb net allowed and some laboratory will have only the microscopy center okay so these are all the unit if you are having you uh, know positive samples immediately the reporting should go to uh, you know district laboratory and to you can refer into the uh, intermediate or the even the national laboratory for the drug resistant things so all these things will come under the national uh, tb elimination program i hope your laboratory is connected to the state tb for the id idsp means the uh, uh, it is the integrated disease surveillance program for everything okay idsp next so this i uh, i just uh, to show you must understood about the algorithm so this algorithm is the old algorithm now recently they changed into new algorithm in this algorithm what is fq and what is uh, sl in this in this what is fq what is fq and what is ha huh? fluoroquinolone and the second line sl means a second line okay so this is how directly or all the presumptive positive tb cases they are putting into the cb net so the cb net will detect the rifampicin resistance okay so that is very very important to detect the resistance nowadays because of the lack of uh, identification and lack of you know detecting the cases by sputum microscopy and culture and other things now we are entering into the det detection of the multi drug re resistant tb next so this is actually uh, uh, you have to check whether all the laboratories you know your uh, hospital laboratories are having the appropriate sop this sop is reviewed by the state or your uh, super first your supervisor and it is reviewed by the state uh, experts whether you prepared this sop with the experts uh, did you send this sop to the experts and corrected and get the signature and approval from them that is very very important for making the sop uh, we cannot copy it from online whatever is available the sop should be modified according to the facility available in your laboratory according to the personal number of the personnel and number of you know, the places the size of the places uh, the infrastructure available Uh, according to that only you have to prepare the sop okay we cannot copy it from the national laboratory or the reference laboratory ours will be the low risk laboratory so according to that you can prepare the sop when you prepare the sop from the sample collection case detection sample uh, collection everything the specimen acceptance criteria rejection criteria everything the culture how to do the test where all the reference you have to give the references so this is how you have to prepare the sop is mandatory for everything okay next so you must learn all the pgs must learn the um, request form the national tb elimination program request form and you have to read everything how the reporting systems are there how they are collecting the sample what are the datas are very very important for uh, making the appropriate that then only the your quality assurance will be pass okay quality assurance of your lab will be pass so you have to keep everything stock okay so you have to keep everything stock the so state people will come state laboratory people will come and check all these things okay next so this in the low uh, low risk laboratory these are all the things will be but the, on the whole the diagnostic procedures sputum smear microscopy gene expert cb net up to that we will have in the low risk laboratory the line probe was in solid culture midget if you are having it is in the moderate uh, risk laboratory if you have the antibiotic susceptibility testing for first line second line then it will be a full fledged uh, you know high risk laboratory so this is how oh, high diagnostic also mm, vice versa you can take so this is how we can set up next okay so now i am going to discuss about only the low risk laboratory so the low, because you are having the uh, sputum microscopy center and also you are having the cb net uh, true net true net cb mm -hmm. net almost uh, uh, same but yesterday only uh, madam told that your lab uh, to see my srm is having true net so i just covered true net okay next 
okay so here how you are uh, doing the uh, the how you are uh, no uh, passing the positive control how you are passing the negative control so all these things are very very important so the positive result of acid pass vary from 0.5 to 10 micro per length okay so this appropriate uh, the structure appropriate interpretation can be given to the positive control that always you have to check for your test okay negative control this is how you have to everything the black background must be a blue color or if you are using malachite green it will be a green color okay so if anything if you see the pink color rod or small one you have to check with the you have to check with the fluorescent microscopy okay and you have to check with what is the next step if you are still having doubt do experts to be checked okay still you are having doubt how the quality to be you have to give more time just a minimum 10 minutes you have to uh, verify in the zigzag position all the smear okay you have to search this is how we have to do so the quality control organisms are there you must have the a yeah, well national level uh, no uh, year marked that uh, mycobacterium species what is h37 rv can anyone expand h37 h37 rv because this is the strain uh, the national laboratories are using for doing antibiotic anti you know mycobacterial susceptibility testing they'll have this so what is h37 rv this is commonly be in all uh, reference laboratory but your laboratory uh, I, anyone can tell what is h37 rv it's a strain name okay i'll tell that it is a h stands for human okay so human the 37th passage okay rough virulent that is the strain is a positive control human 37th passage is no? that then the rough virulent strain this is the national level laboratory but now the positive control is changed but in the national laboratory uh, ni uh, no that's a national tb uh, uh, reference laboratory is in chennai chetpat they are using the h37 rv negative control will be the proven uh, negative control to be used in the laboratory next slide next i'll go for the true net so this is the cbnet or true net laboratory so when i ask the lot no you have to check for all the materials lysis buffer is there the quantity is uh, correct or not whether they are ke they kept the manual or not okay the brochure the procedure brochure or everything on the cartridge is there that cartridge also you have to check whether it is fit into the machine or not so everything you have to check and then only you have to receive okay as soon as you receive you have to check everything and mark it any error you close it and return back to the manufacturer next so this is how yeah a, a microscopy and the tb nut lab uh, uh, i just to show there should be a separate uh, smear uh, preparation area that should be connected to the outside environment always the smear preparation area okay other thing can be in the ac room but it should be in a separate microscopy separate record room is separate storage room should, should be separate every room must have a hand washing procedures you see the uh, microscopy area is separate another way there is a one passage that is the uh, slide window you have to receive all the slides you should not receive in the main door okay next next slide so this is if you have the true net uh, very less space if you have a true net and if you also have the microscopy you can divide into two separately the smear area and you can separately make on uh, rapid molecular test unit so the rapid molecular test unit definitely there should be on laminar flow uh, for sample preparation and other thing and uh, the refrigerator can be kept in the even in the corridor that is in the uh, cold uh, Walk-in, walk-in cooler room. Okay, next. So, if you want to conduct a training session in your CBNet laboratory, okay, this is how I took from because it's everyone must know about how the training session is going on in the uh, any laboratory. Okay, for the TrueNet laboratory, a point care laboratory. you have to see the available spaces are there the microscope everything all the uh, no the appliances and for uh, demonstrating the trainings are available or not 
you have to well plan the exercise okay how, what are the batches how to do all the lots are correct or not whether the positive control is there or not negative control is there or not everything you have to check then setting up of the training hall everything and the equipment and other thing to check for the equipment supply reagent sample wherever you want a checklist you put the checklist and unnecessary items should be removed they should not get the confusion between the true net and other thing okay so it's true net means that uh, the the training uh, particular training uh, equipments and other thing must be there okay so you should not confuse with the other uh, diagnostic things here yeah. okay so on the bio safety precautions on the biomedical waste management everything how they are discarding the slides all these things are also important next slide okay so the quality assurance control and assessment of the true net what they will do the overall uh, quality assurance program how the uh, they will you uh, know establish and monitor the controls and how you are performing the equas and the recording of the equas and finally they will uh, you know analyze all the performance indicators they will have the checklist for performance indicator yesterday dr uh, you know binesh explained very well about the indicators and what are the equas program is running on next so essential elements for the quality assurance in your laboratory is the standard documents first of all whether all the standard documents for smear separately testing procedures and no result and recording and storage things separate registers are there or not and the competency assessment and internal quality controls are you know separate registers and the equas program and proficiency testing Uh, whenever the rechecking done the separate register should be there okay whenever the supervising done that should be in a separate register so all these documents are verified for the accreditation next so the true that uh, tb as a incorporate an internal positive control that the process that the specimen undergo from extraction from extraction to amplification all the procedures are correct or not whether the internal control and the positive control negative control are work well or not if you do uh, want to do with the positive control you have to run from the sample processing up to the uh, ending this will give the validation validity how to check the validity of the machine you have to run with the positive control you have to run with the negative control from the first step to end step recording that is the, uh, the, the this is how you have to assess the validity of the a particular equipment next okay next i'll pass on to the mycology after that we will go for the quiz it's very interesting uh, thing you can uh, also discuss this is recently the who they uh, no can you uh, enlarge this yeah so this is the this is how the, this is the who i took it from the who uh, website this is the priority one development of best practices guidelines for fungal diagnostics okay priority two development validation of standard uh, rapid molecular assays and development of multi center validation that is called equas that is called equas okay so they gave uh, the pathogens what are the pathogens to be identified in the minimum the fungal laboratory that is there okay so this is the actually uh, you know all the uh, capacity building the structure is okay or not and you are having the adequate uh, um, equipments or the uh, things for conducting the particular test or not next next slide okay so what are the essential things to assess the quality uh, of your laboratory fungal laboratory yeah, again it's same a standard uh, operating procedures on detection of the antifungal resistance and antimicrobial uh, resistance surveillance network or there or not these three things are checked by the idsp by the uh, in um, icmr okay if you are having only the preliminary level microscopy that is okay and the rapid molecular test like molditoff that is also okay okay next so this is the available ecosystem by national level icmr for fungus fungus still uh, we need you uh, know more uh, development for the assessment uh, quality assessment because we are in the beginning stage but international level is well ahead for the quality assurance program for uh, fungus but in india it is now uh, many of the laboratories are participating even in the 
fungal identification they are developing the fungal laboratory a very good uh, fungal laboratory at least a 24 bar 7 point pair uh, testings of uh, the mo rapid molecular test and the rapid serological test for uh, uh, fungal this fungal pathogens okay the dna uh, uh, serology the preliminary identifications and the antibody serological tests are available in the dna these are the tests available everywhere in all the laboratory next so this is the uh, national center for disease control they have one uh, surveillance of invasive fungal infections for covid patients during covid time you know about the mucormycosis how it created the, the it involved in that pandemic and it created a separate uh, root pandemic uh, it's uh, the mucormycosis so the fungus we have to give a importance in fungal uh, quality assurance of the laboratory and uh, no we have to give attention to the uh, detection of the fungus with the appropriate manner Next. so this is the fungal pathogens to be identified this is given in the who website what is the priority organisms we have to at least look for so please enlarge this okay in your lab if you find out anything the structure how will you go for for uh, how will you go further immediately you will report the patient that uh, some fungal elements so usually we will give fungal elements presence so what they will do the clinicians they will think they uh, they won't wait for the um fungus appropriate uh, uh, name of the pathogen and antifungal susceptibility testing they will start the uh, and uh, uh, treatment with the antifungal agents this will again is the problem will create the uh, resistance in the community so nowadays detection how to detection we have to at least you have to send it to the last reference laboratory once you find in the uh, microscopy or uh, by you know preliminary culture and you have to confirm it with the reference laboratory or with the national laboratory or nearby reference laboratory and finally you give the report to the clinicians okay but uh, presumptively you can inform them but particularly the antifungal susceptibility we can try with the uh, not to try we have to do with the reference laboratory with the isolate but uh, sh make sure that is not a contaminant okay that is part of the quality assurance next so the mycology laboratory you have to need to identify the filamentous fungi on the yeast so this is how uh, the two things are there the laboratory structure definitely it should have a, a negative pressure okay next slide bsl2 so the specimen processing the container you have to check for the same for mycobacteriology check for the leak proof container and you know the uh, specimen is not outside like okay next so the staining so staining usually the gram staining is not recommended for the mycology but sometimes for the yeast we will do the gram staining so you have to check for the all the stains quality for the gram stain okay the koh calcofluor white whenever you use calcofluor white or koh you have to check for the hazardous of the material staining material how to discard it properly you have to see the health of the uh, the risk you know protection to the technicians also technicians and whoever is working in the mycology laboratory that is the uh, te technical persons personnel's safety we have to uh, take it into considerations okay how to discard the infectious material and all next so the koh already i told you you must uh, use this koh with the precautions safety precautions to use for the koh also okay it is not uh, that much hazardous but you have to dispose it appropriately next slide next slide so culture reading so the culture uh, reading how to do you have to uh, know the petri dish plates uh, this is the actually uh, how to work as soon as you have that some uh, fungal culture immediately you have to stain it so you choose the appropriate staining and find out whether it is filamentous fungi mold or something else okay then you have to uh, check it with the reference uh, strains okay reference strains for the yeast in general uh, you can use the open bench but uh, definitely we need a class 2 to work on the mold filamentous fungi next slide 
so the result interpretations are very very important the result interpretation you have to check with the positive control okay and the negative control should be there so the quality control should be assessed with the uh, positive control strain and the negative control strain in the laboratory mycology laboratory next slide this is how we have to do the result interpretations so the clsi recently published a three different uh, no modules you can get it from the no online these are the three uh, standard antifungal susceptibility testing if you are going to develop antifungal susceptibility testing so you can uh, get these module and follow the uh, standard operating procedures and other things about uh, the standard controls and the procedures uh, from this module next okay so this is how the antifungal i didn't touch the quality control of the antifungal susceptibility testing again i am telling uh, i just touched with the low risk laboratory of microscopic identification and a preliminary identification even the serology okay but when i show the you no know, quiz then you will understand some more uh, quality indicators uh, to be concentrated for mycobacteriology laboratory and for mycology laboratory so any questions about uh, uh, this presentation any question <laughs> so if you are doing the culture in the midget or with the solid lj medium definitely a training is mandatory so you check whether your laboratory technicians or the experts are well versed with the uh, technical you are having the sop or not if not you can get the training session from the national reference laboratory i told you the chetpat the national tb center is available you can you can get the time and training allotment and you can go there directly and how to identify and you must differentiate the typical tb and the atypical tb also all these things you know they will train you the positive control you are having or not the negative control you are also you are having the appropriate sop or not in that sop whether it is matches with anybody uh, reviewed it or not experts are reviewed it or not all these things are necessary for the uh, culture okay the quality of the media that is a separate quality assurance for the media quality okay you have to put the positive control and check for the media quality and storage of the media after the reading how you are reading first of all it's a weekly ones or daily ones it's a slow grower okay okay and for the if you are using the back tech how you are doing so these all things will be in the sop it should be you know matches with the standard reference laboratory all these things then and there we have to check in the result interpretations also so anybody the supervisors are coming and checking this cultures yes then it is uh, no problem you are in the surveillance program they will come and do it but anyway you have to check for the training sessions frequent training sessions and the registration registers are up to the mark for the quality assurance okay and you have to check for all the tools using for the culture and susceptibility testings if, are you doing the anti uh, mycobacterial susceptibility testing no no anyway whatever the culture available do you, are you sending it to reference laboratory to do the anti uh, mycobacterial susceptibility testing ast ast if not we have to start so culture alone is not enough because of the multi drug resistant tb otherwise you have to check with the cb net and confirm it with then uh, you can send the strain to the reference laboratory okay lpa that is that that was the one uh, for the diagnosis of the resistant so that's okay that is okay shall we go any other questions shall we go for the quiz yes Huh? Yes, yes. Inter laboratory and uh, no within the within the laboratory you have to assess it. 
you have to assess a batch wise okay the proficiency testing you have to do uh, within the laboratory itself and you have to do with a inter laboratory your laboratory in the nearby laboratory yesterday they told you they have to you have to put a mou with a uh, some medical colleges you can put with the government medical colleges mou okay so you can send your sample there they can send their sample here you can get the reference material from there and you can do it and send the result they will review it and check it this is how we have to do the uh, in quality okay then the equos you can participate you must participate in the equos any other questions shall we go for the next session yeah i have another 15 minutes i'll finish that okay okay then i'll go for actually okay so uh, this is a very interesting session i hope you will answer for all these things okay this is the quiz so can, can we divide into two batches can we divide into you both of you can come here and join here both of you come here and join so this is uh, batch a this is batch b okay batch a batch b if they are answering their one mark who will do that please do that answer okay no mark you just provide mark this is batch a batch b okay so batch a answer well mark one one mark if not they will have that's a half mark otherwise you give one mark okay one mark one on mark so no confusion okay let us go for the quiz okay batch a and batch b now we are going entering into the session a quiz uh, in the uh, participants okay first slide this is uh, simply the topic identify the picture and explain about the quality okay it's, a, it's about quality i think uh, uh, after this quiz i can cover the, at least the low risk laboratory things okay next next slide okay so where you go you have you are using in your laboratory these symbols or not if so what is that batch uh, a you explain what is this you have to explain what is this where, where all in your laboratory you kept these things okay where all in your laboratory you kept these things batch a no no you just explain what is that uh, no triangle red no 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 internet checking no internet checking please put your mobile down just it's a thought process you just think and tell that is enough no problem if you no know, you don't know answer not at all a problem this is a learning session a training session you will learn so don't worry about that don't check the thing because it's a competition yes huh, keep okay no yellow no okay batch b batch b no what it indicates what it indicates alert alert is okay but specifically you have to tell as you are a post graduate and you know you, um, bio safety alert specific cautions no no over batch a over okay i will go to the answer please answer yes the first one is the you have to stick failure to follow instruction may affect your health or damage to the equipment whether you stick this in your laboratory equipments or not i don't know but if not you do hereafter if not please stick this okay uh, the yellow failure to follow instructions may affect the results or damage of the equipment whether you kept these two or not this is uh, okay so you have to check these two Okay, shall I go next to the batch B? Next question is for batch B. Please, next. Ah, yes. Batch B, can you explain uh, this? Identify the quality of the sputum. Okay. Ha, okay. Blood stained, salivary. Next. Mucoid. Which is mucoid? Which is mucoid? Second is mucoid. 
first is mucopurulent second is mucoid third is uh, uh, blood stains and fourth is saliva how did you uh, know find out the saliva how did you find out the saliva okay uh, almost uh, they are correct almost they are correct but they changed the mucopurulent and the purulent but anyway we'll give one mark to the batch b answer please answer please okay a good quality specimen mucoid a good quality specimen purulent a good quality specimen blood stain this is the poor quality we have to identify by the bubbles identified by the bubbles okay next slide please next batch a so batch a this very simple only can you explain this picture batch a batch a huh? two samples to be collected okay okay uh, this picture is denoting that number of the samples okay separate ventilator you just uh, appropriately tell because it's a quality assessment answer to the question we should not you know assume and tell all that will not fit into the quality assessment we have a, a appropriate a statement for everything that is the assessment shall i go to the batch b batch b batch b please early morning sputum sample okay <laughs> both are no both are uh, not getting a mark for this this is actually a sputum collection technique how you are instructing the patient how you are instructing the technicians to collect it should not be from front to front you should not know without mask other thing you cannot collect the sample in the closed room you have to collect in the open air okay and you have to instruct the patients appropriately from the deep next slide please answer is there okay this is wrong the technician should not stand in front of the patient tb patient okay this is how you have to instruct during the it should be in the open air not in the closed room then the, the tb bacilli will be survive in the room and it will cause uh, no contamination next spread of the infection next slide okay batch a identify and explain what it is and explain batch b ah uh, sorry sorry batch b slides wrap slides wrap slides. correct what for what for slides wrap correct what for to avoid scratches what is the appropriate name you will write it in the register what is the appropriate uh, which register you will take for this to entry where you will do this because in the processing you won't do where you will do this after staining or before staining before staining it will be in like this only na that on box will be there it will be like it is after staining or before staining ha huh? slide preservation very good then how to do can you explain how to do please tell me <laughs> okay tissue paper you spreaded okay place the slide roll it okay full mark next slide next slide please yes so how do you do it spread the paper keep it first roll then second row, second slide roll it third slide roll it like that you have to stock the stain until the supervisor come and check the slides you have to store it appropriately like this okay okay one mark next uh, a batch next slide please yes can you comment this slide quality of the slide can you comment fast because my next speaker is waiting i have to finish no next 10 slides next shall i go to batch b okay batch b please third is low quality so other things are good third is good quality okay second 
for the last one is only going to be spread here. And uh, that is a very low quantity of spinal. Okay. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so no, both the badges not getting the mark. Actually, all the slides are inappropriate. How I will show you? It is in one end. And the the this also they mark it in uh, uh, no some uh, striking and other things are there. And a different next slide please. Yeah, upper these are all wrong. These are all wrong. Okay. So the correct is the smear should be oval shape. It should be in the center. Not should be in the corner or in the no. It is not uniform. It is uniform. The one corner, the lab number. This is how you have to prepare, and you have to do the no no heating while heating in the split lab. The smear should be upward. It's not should be downward. Okay, it should be upward. All these things you have to follow, and uh, no, so this, you see the mark here. So the yellow mark. So if you are not doing it appropriately, you just your result will vary. So there, the staining area you you have to keep this mark. If you are not doing this staining smear procedure well, your test results will be uh, no false. Okay, this is how you have to keep. Okay, next slide. Next slide, which batch? Batch A, batch B. You have to tell man. <laughs> batch A. Ah, uh, batch B. Uh, batch B, please comment this. Discuss about this slide. Should not be keep overlap. Okay. Appropriate. Okay. Okay. I'll go to batch A. Can you explain this? After staining, we should not keep this. Uh, okay, uh, uh, both the batch didn't get the mark. Actually, this is the correct thing only. It is appropriate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Actually, this is uh, no. Uh, they they just roll it. Uh, no, the the roll it from the beginning to end. Up, from the number from lower number to higher number. So this is the correct uh, thing you have to keep. Okay. See one five seven one one five seven two. Next one five eight one one five eight two. So this is correct. Okay, so correctly the batch number to be from first to last like that. Batch number in the increasing order you have to keep. This uh, inappropriately you uh, you should not keep the uh, higher number front and the lower number back. It will be very difficult to identify the slides and to recheck it and evaluate it. So this is how you have to keep everything, okay? And how the direction to see from one corner to this uh, corner, we can call zigzag position. You have to see the complete smear at least minimum ten minutes to fifteen minutes. You have to uh, verify minimum ten minutes, okay? Next slide. If you are experts, five minutes. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Come on. This is a batch A. Um, this is the uh, you know what is this cedar wood oil. So please comment. What is your comment? Yes. Okay. The down. So which is correct? Which is correct and why? Okay, I'll pass to batch B. This all immediately rapid fire. Second one is correct. Why? Ah. Oh, okay. Both batch wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. Actually, the first one is correct. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. If the cedar wood or oil is mixed with the xylene, it will be transparent. Z if you mix with the xylene, what will happen? The quality of the smear will go off. Sometimes the technician they'll mix with the xylene. So uh, you cannot, uh, the, uh, you may find a false, uh, no negative, false negative. So this is actually may, uh, cedar wood oil. This is a thick cedar wood oil. The refractive index should be very less so that the glass rod should not be visible. This is a good thing. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Ah, uh, B batch, please. Come on, this.
TB bacilli, correct? TB bacilli. Clumps, okay, correct? Next, okay. I'll go to the batch uh, A. Batch A. Okay, second one, second one, okay. Okay, why it not stained properly? It's just so. Any other uh, justification? For who? <laughs> So the batch A is discussing, so we will stick to the rules because we are in assessment. So we'll stick into the rules of quality practices. Let the batch A explain. Almost correct batch A, but you have to tell which sample. She almost told, but okay, anyway, I'll give the mark to them. It is the salivary sample. That is the purulent sample. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the salivary sample. That's why the... Uh, result but it's a it's a positive sample it is a positive sample you may miss false negative false negative so smear negative don't rule out that tb is negative you have to recheck and you have to get again uh, get the sample and the inter observer very you know variations may be there so you give it to the other people to check the smear okay next slide please next slide please yes a batch please comment Please comment. Yes, objective. Huh? Yes, missing. Why? You have to justify what it is, what is in your mind, how you have to keep your uh, no sputum microscopy laboratory. And if it, if so, what is uh, no, the step you have to follow? If no one is missing, what will you do? You should not use. What will happen? This is how I am asking. Okay, batch B. Okay, no problem. I'll go for the next answer slide. Please go. This is a little difficult. Or oh, next, if the one is missing, you have to cover it. Otherwise, the fungal, the airborne thing will go inside and uh, you know, it will stick into the lenses. So this is how you should not use xylene to clean the microscope. Then what else? Please answer. I'll give mark. What else? It is given. It is given. <laughs> what else? Xylene should not be used. But we are still many laboratory. I am observing many laboratory are using xylene. It is toxic. It is dangerous. The biohazard, as how to uh, no discard it, it's very difficult. So uh, tell me, alcohol. We can use alcohol, okay? So we can use the methyl alcohol. If you zoom it, uh, they can see. Please zoom it, no? The answer part alone. Yes. Manufacturer recommendation for the microscope. You have to follow ethyl alcohol, eighty to twenty percent, or alcohol. Okay. Benzene uh, also you can use. Okay, acetone you can, uh, you should not use for long term use, but uh, for emergency you can use. But all these things you should not use. Appropriate is this xylene, no, no xylene. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, explain B batch. Result. Now uh, we are in the result part. Explain, please. What? But RNTCP training, no, it is a grading, grading, okay, correct. You just explain, you just explain. Okay, next uh, batch A, batch A, please explain this. Just expand, expand there, that's enough, you expand it, that's enough. Okay, I'll go for this uh, answer, please. 
this is nothing false positive fp false positive fn false negative two is the quality error actually we have to read it a false positive how the false positive comes so false positive avoid okay the stain should be very appropriate okay otherwise you may interpret okay uh, artifacts you may interpret artifact as a tb bacilli so that should be avoided and false negative actually false negative uh, you may miss because of the poor staining quality and poor staining procedure inappropriate use of a microscope okay the uh, not a correct microscope all these thing will go lead to false negative okay then quantification error that is the this is the quantification na you have to grade it so this is the quantification error how the quantification error come they uh, won't spend correct time to check the uh, thing the just one field they'll see they'll report it and go they have to see 100 fields that is the quantification error okay so this is how the quantification error may come appropriate time for checking the slide is very very important otherwise your observer or accreditation people will come with this chart and they'll make it more of uh, quantification error more of false negative they may not give the accreditation to your laboratory next slide please next slide okay you just next fungus for four questions next final send can you tell what are the pre analytical things for the quality you need analytical things and post analytical for fungal laboratory uh, a batch see so far so many you uh, know training over talks over so you can tell now appropriate handling in which area which area appropriate sample collection which area pre analytical then quantity of the specimen then one important thing oh answer you showed slept <laughs> okay no mark for anyone okay go to the next slide go to the next slide no 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 before 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 a previous one okay that sop is very very important okay for pre analytical and laboratory personal training is important and specimen collection of course you told and the analytical is uh, media media and reagents test procedure and the processing and the result accuracy and the post analytical reporting and uh, recording record keeping so this is how for all laboratory for mycology definitely this you have to follow okay next slide next slide okay so i am showing b batch so this is the different samples for fungal can you tell what is the rejection or unaccepted uh, unacceptable of the sample criteria for each one at least two three you tell i'll give mark unaccept uh, unacceptance of the sample mm -hmm. for all uh, many things are there i just uh, i cut down and uh, put this okay tell blood urine feces urine can you tell urine what is the unacceptance criteria for urine midstream urine ha huh? uh, at least you can tell about uh, no pus purulent biopsy okay then uh, for serology okay uh, i'll go to batch a please at least one or two you tell me see these are all the samples for fungal identification what is the unacceptance of the samples for the sample unacceptance means there is an one criteria we should not accept urine one criteria we should not accept blood one criteria we should not pass for exclusively for fungus understood uh -huh. very good very good that's one in a biopsy in a formalin is rejected okay no 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 let them finish let them finish urine uro bag appropriate for fungus with the hours can you tell with the hours 24 hours is rejected okay we'll go for the next slide for the time constraints i'm just going here so this swab is unacceptable 
a dry swab there is no uh, adequate uh, no material will be there for the further process all the test materials are waste okay the grains you know for the mycot uh, mycetoma the grain sample how to collect in the clean uh, okay you have to uh, deep it will be in the deep not in the superficial they should not send the scab and tell that it is a grain okay as yes, grains so all these things other 24 hours you have to reject so all these uh, things you have swabs are rejected okay so you have to check for all the sample acceptance criteria next slide please next slide yes okay this is the uh, strain uh, uh, that is the quality control strains for an example atcc strains for to check the media fungus media a batch or b batch a batch to test the different fungus media uh, fungal medias are there for an example sab rots um, agar bird seed agar blood agar for each uh, different types of the agar what is the quality control strain you will put and check the media and keep and keep it in the record for sabrots agar how to check the media quality with which strain sabrots agar uh, uh, you tell one or two you tell just one or two batch b batch b urease what is the answer trichophyton okay let us check next slide please let us check next slide yes actually we have to negative control what is the negative control answer is e coli show me this uh, the please enlarge it See for the sabrots dextrose, candida albicans. Negative is E. coli. Potato dextrose agar, aspergillus. Negative is E. coli. Maltose extract, aspergillus niger. Okay. Uh, urease, actually, this is cryptococcus. Cryptococcus. Neoformans for urease. Okay. Germ P, candida albicans. So, now today you have to learn for each media, appropriate strains to be put and test. Okay, you should not you uh, check the media with the different inappropriate um, organisms. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, which batch? B batch. Yeah, B batch, B batch. Just comment this. In your lab, you are identifying this type. What will you do? In your lab, you are identifying this. So, what is your comment? You do LPCB, okay. You do slide culture. Then what will you do? No, you, you are doing the LPCB. What you will find out? So, okay, morphology. Then how you will check? Send it to the laboratory. Almost correct. We will give one mark. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, each and every lab should have an atlas or the reference uh, material to check that but uh, this is not the final confirmatory you can send it to the lab the reference laboratory and get the confirmatory results but you do you have the uh, no atlas to match and to find out to discuss with the team and find out what it is you have to do of course uh, lpcb and you have to find out each thing okay you have to refer it next slide okay what is uh, a batch please comment Safety in the fungus laboratory. N95 mask. One mark. So this is inappropriate for fungus as well as TB. Fungus and as well as TB. Next slide. So we have to use this mask. Next slide. Thank you very much for participating in this session. Uh, thank you very much for participating in the quiz. I hope uh, I just fulfill uh, a yeah, small percentage of the how to assess the quality assessment for mycobacteriology and fungus. Thank you for this opportunity. Can we see the score? Both the batch uh, received 3-3 three, three marks equally. 3-3 three, three marks out of 15. Out of 15. So I think the quality should be improved. <laughs> Quality should be improved. Next time when we come, the quality assurance monitoring will be done by us. 
thank you very much uh, i must thank dr chitra rajalakshmi for giving me this opportunity thank you the organizing team thank you ma'am for enlightening us with this quality practices it was such a informative interactive and intellectual session may i now request dr chitra rajalakshmi ma'am professor and head department of microbiology organizing chairperson of this unicora 2023 to honor our guest dr mangai karasim ma'am with a momento now i call upon our next speaker dr s sendil kumaran sir professor senior consultant of biochemistry chief quality officer in nabh and nabl the madras medical mission hospital chennai sir completed his undergraduation mbbs in government mohan kumaramangala medical college salem and post graduation md in jipmer pondicherry and also completed mba in hospital administration from pgs offshore coimbatore Sir has published many research papers, including two national publications and ten international publications. Sir has also written two books: Review of Genetics by J P Brothers, New Delhi, and Review of Immunology by J P Brothers, New Delhi. And also served as a research guide for M B B S, M D Biochemistry, P H D in Biochemistry, and M E in Biomedical Engineering and M B A, and Master of Public Health. May I request you, sir, to share the knowledge of clinical audit roles and responsibilities. Uh, good morning, all. Thank you very much for the best way of introduction. And uh, so, I would like to thank the management and uh, uh, Dr. Chitra Rajalakshmi for inviting me the interesting topic about the clinical audit. Yeah. Thank you. So let me uh, so let me have a a brief introduction. What we are going to do in this one hour. So the first will be I will be giving a premise about the topic. Uh, that be that will be for some few minutes followed by uh, the powerpoint presentation the first half will be uh, i will be performing the second half and you have to perform from your end that is you have to do a clinical audit and you have to come and present over here so you have got all the templates of the clinical audits and everything about that so let me start uh, uh, the session directly into that so uh, how many of you know about clinical audit what is clinical audit can you just define from your own words and jargons Yes. Any idea about clinical audit? How many of you does not know about clinical audit? Please raise your hands. Okay. So, so, so uh, this is more relevant. Okay. So, what I can say is clinical audit. You would have heard about many audit like your NABL internal audit, NABH audit, financial audit, other kind of audits and all. So, clinical audit refers to a very simple one liner. I can say uh, evaluating performance against established standards eps okay evaluating the performance against established standard that stand for the clinical audit okay so my agenda is very simple one i have to kindle interest all of you in clinical audit 
and it should not be um, uh, it should not be a monotonous you have to speak from your end okay these are the two agenda for today's meeting so uh, that, that's about the clinical audit evaluating performance against established standards so that's the first point so what you have to do you have to evaluate the performance of a local or local department or interdepartmental and you have to compare with the standards okay let us go one by one so what the first is you have to evaluate the performance what is the performance in your department in a particular sector and next one is standards so you have to set right the standards for the performance so so what are the standards the standards we have to derive from the guidelines so before that i would like to uh, uh, share what, what is a clinical audit how does it differ from the uh, uh, your uh, research publications and all so any idea about that okay so clinical audit is the one where i already said you have to evaluate the performance against the established standards but it is not akin to the research publications whatever you are doing right no so what you have in research publications you will have a hypothesis okay based on the hypothesis you will sort your research either it could be an um, uh, systematic or it random allocation research and you derive the results you do you do a very human statistical analysis say it could be a parity test sympathy test anova anything and based on the statistical report you will derive a conclusion and you can discuss the topic and even you can do the meta analysis this is about your research but clinical audit is as simple as this okay you don't have to go for any cumbersome uh, what i can say a statistical research and even it does not need an ethical committee clearance clinical audit but you have to do with some basic ethics ethics guidelines that that's clinical audit be, um, being that the information which you are gathering should be confidential and staff anonymity and the patient's anonymity has to be maintained so in this way the clinical audit differ from the research okay so we have some standards you are do, you are uh, you are just comparing your yes i mean your performance with the standards that is your clinical audit but research is that you have some hypothesis the null hypothesis is a true or false you have to evaluate and you have to give a reports okay next where do you derive from the standards so there are standards where there are international guidelines which set right standards for doing clinical audits the most common which we are following in our hospital is nice guidelines by nhs okay nice guidelines and scottish guidelines science guidelines and even the research publications we can uh, we can set as a standard okay and meta analysis if it is not there there are some gap analysis which you can find in your own department that you can set it as a standard and you can do the clinical audit i have done a clinical audit in the uh, biochemistry department uh, in the laboratory side that uh now the critical alert which we are informing to the user end okay whether they are documenting or intervening that okay so that we have find that gap so once you i, I think all of you are familiar about the enable documentation so what we will be doing we will be doing the we will be evaluating the critical alerts and will be informing and will be for othering to the time sets okay so what is happening to the other end critical alert once it is informed it has to be followed by the user end so we have done a small gap analysis in this and we have done a clinical and audit uh, clinical and uh, audit on that so first is the first point is setting right of standards the standards can be derived from global international accepted guidelines like nice and sign or research methodologies or your gap analysis it could be anything it could be anything then why you have to do the clinical audit what is the purpose of the clinical audit any ideas okay so here comes the donabedian model either you can in, uh, the clinical audit the main purpose of the clinical audit is patient care enhancing the patient care so we are doing in a structured way the enhancing the patient care in what structured way so based on the donabedian model structure process and outcome these are the three triads which we have to concentrate our co uh, clinical audit either the structure of the process of the patient care we have to concentrate or process the process of the um, patient care we have to concentrate or the outcome yes p wo outcome we have to concentrate that is the main purpose of doing the clinical audit either we have to enhance the structure of the process or um, process or outcome spo guidelines so that is the purpose so once we have set right the standard then we have to find out in what way our departmental or our uh, interdisciplinary team differs or lag behind the standards okay then you have to find out your uh, data analysis it is not it is not just uh, this very simple kind of doing the data analysis you can set it your own data you have to derive the data of the patient and you can do the data analysis you, you have to document the data now after documenting the data you have to compare with the standards okay suppose if you have kept as a standard of 
more than 95 percentage of the critical alert has to be interwoven properly suppose if the gap analysis says only 70 percentage the remaining 30 percent is pending behind then what you have to do is the process is not adequate okay then you have to concentrate on the concentrate on the process so what you have to do you have to do training immense training and you have to re-evaluate and re-audit and you have to create sensitization for the user end either it could be a staff nurse it could be a doctor it could be a consultant anybody else anybody else you have to do that and you have to document that and you have to again you have to do the re-audit so it is akin to the pdc pdca cycle what is pdca plan to check and act okay then after do, after a certain period of time after giving the training after giving the sensitization about the topic you have to do the re-audit okay in the re-audit again you have to collect the data the data should be as simple as possible you have to collect the data and you have to compare the data with the pre-existing standards okay if you were fulfilled with the standards okay if you are fulfilled the standards either it could be a national or international or meta analysis or gap analysis then your clinical audit is over okay and that is not the end of the game so what you are getting you are concluding something from the clinical audit okay the conclusion has to give some recommendation across the hospitals okay so that is very important so you have to recommend based on the clinical audit you have to recommend across the hospital so these are all the changes which we have to do for enhancing the patient care understood have you got a clear idea about this so clinical audit is just very simple this is very simple but when we happen to do, it's just like a Pandora's box. Lots of things will evolve in each and every department. So now, since because it's a microbiology, we can concentrate on the uh, topics pertaining to the microbiology only, right? So we have done more than 50 clinical audits for the past, I mean, uh, two or three years. Uh, so it encompasses from anesthesia to critical care to microbiology to laboratory side and many things. So the first one is evaluating the performance against existing standards. First one. The next one is you have to set right the standards. How will you set right the standards? Based on international, national, meta-analysis and gap analysis. Next, you have to do the basic evaluation based on the structure, process and outcome. Okay. Next, what you have to do? You have to compare with the existing standard. So if it is adequate, okay, well and good. You have to recommend. If it is not adequate, you have to do, if it's adequate also, you have to do a re-audit after a certain defined time interval. Okay. So if the re-audit is uh, uh, adequate, then what you have to do, you have to conclude your clinical audit. You have to recommend the clinical audit to the hospital setup. Okay. This recommendation will benefit the patient, will benefit the hospital, will benefit your peer workers, will benefit the community. Okay. So that is the very purpose of clinical audit. Okay. Clinical audit is not a, uh, a, what, a research topic. It is different from the research topic because it does not need any ethical clearance guidelines. But you have to do uh, with some basic ethical background the clinical audits understood this okay so this is a basic structural format of the clinical audit now we can go when you have when you are clear so we will enhance your i mean clarity to the powerpoint when we are not clear again we can enhance your confusion to the powerpoint we are good in both ways Yeah. So this is the definition of the clinical audit. So this is systematic critical analysis of the quality of the healthcare, including the procedure used for diagnosis, treatment and care, the use of resources and the resulting outcome and quality for quality of life for the patients as per the NHS guidelines. So this is a tracing of the clinical audit, which I have given in the handouts. I don't have to repl re replicate again and again. When you go through that, you will get um, understanding. The clinical audit, it was previously called as medical audit. Now they renamed it as clinical audit, right? Next. So this is very important. This is very important. This is the crux of today's topic, OK? So what is the process of a clinical audit? You have to select the process. You have to select the process which is relevant. Okay, which is relevant for enhancing the patient care, not many topics, you know, oh, like, you know, but like research, we are doing some other topics, oxidative system, so on, so on, so on, so on, so okay, like that, okay, suppose if it is relevant or not relevant, we have to do some publications for the sake of the publication, we have to publish for the sake of the, what I can say, for the sake of what I can say, and um, promotion, we have to do some publications, clinical audit, not like that, just erase your publications idea with the clinical audit, you have to select a relevant topic for enhancing the patient care. Next one is setting the standards. Hmm? Setting the standards. So you have to set the standards, which we have already uh, um, uh, um, briefly in the uh, briefly in the precise. Next, compare with the 
predetermined standard. So you have selected the topic, you have set the standard, you have to compare the existing with the predetermined standard. Next, you have to implement changes in a phased manner. So this is uh, this seems to be very easy when we happen to the, uh, when we happen to speak in theory, you know. Uh, but when in reality, when we go in a hospital setup, you know, implementing the changes, you know, it's not that easy. You know, doctor, there are doctors, there are consultants, there are, there are chief cardiologists, there are physician assistants, there will be nurses, you know. So you have to you have to conglomerate everybody's brain to implement the changes, which is a really, really difficult task for us. Okay, not that easy. You have to make them to accept that. So based on based on the standard performance, we have to enhance the quality of the hospital, quality of the performance of the laboratory. So we need to have to implement the changes. This is a challenging task when we happen to do in the uh, in the administration or in the managerial side, but we have to do that because our intention is to enhance the patient care. The fourth point. The fifth point is that review the changes periodically. Once the clinical audit over, you just just not just put the paper our audit to over. You have to review, keep on reviewing that. Okay. There will be lacking again and again. So you have to review as per your set set rate standard of timeline. You have to review the uh, clinical audit very periodically based on a six months or a three months uh, uh, or in a time interval. You have to review the periodically the uh, clinical audit. Okay. So again, I would like to repeat, this is what you are going to do if you happen to do in your laboratory or in the hospital setup. You have to select the topic, the topic which is relevant, which will enhance the st structure, process and outcome. And next is setting the standards. You have to set the, set the standard. Next, comparing with the predetermined specifications and Im implementation of the changes and review the changes periodically, which means that you have to do re-audit again and again. Next one. So next one is you have to evaluate the topic. Okay, you will be having some idea. You you got some idea about, about clinical audit now, right now. Am I right, right? Yes, I'm right. Okay. So how will you select the topic? So there are some certain criteria for selecting the topic. Is the topic cost effective, cost risk to the staffs of the use, users? If it is there, then you should not uh, you should not select the topic. So the first criteria is you should not create any havoc or risk for the patients or the user. In. Okay, that's the first criteria. Followed by, is there any relevance of the quality problem? That's what I again and again telling. There should be some relevance for that. Okay, patient complaints are higher complication state. Is there good evidence available in form of standards such as this is a standard systematic reviews, national clinical guidelines, NICE, National Institute of Health and uh, Care Excellence. NICE guidelines, you can go Google search, you can put the NICE guidelines. It will give lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, clinical audit topics. When you put the microbiology, when you put the infectious diseases, you have INIC guidelines. I think you will be knowing better than me. Okay, what is INIC? International Consortium for Nosocomial. Okay, so uh, they have some standards, right? And like uh, sign sign uh, um, uh, sign standards, Scottish inter intercollegiate guidelines network, Cochrane systemic based review. So these are the good evidence based on the evidence base. You can do some. Uh, you can set the standards or or based on the gap analysis also. You can do the. You can set the standards. Next is is the problem amenable change. That is very important. The problem which you are focusing should be amenable to change. Okay. Otherwise, there is no point in doing the clinical audit. Okay. Next one is there's a present previous. Does the present audit shall examine one of the following components of the healthcare? So, Donobanian model, I have already stressed on again and again structure, process, and outcome. It has to focus in any one of this. Okay. Next is, is patient's anonymity is maintained? This is very important. Suppose if you're documenting the data in the clinical audit, you should not use a patient name and other, I mean, confidentiality. The confidence, even though it is does not need any ethical committee clearance, you have to maintain certain confidentiality one. And patient anonymity has to be maintained. You have to just put the UHID number or any hospital registration number, age and sex. Other details should not be explicitly exhibited in the uh, in the clinical audit data. Should be, in fact, this is our non-conformance which come across. Actually, actually this is Donabedian. Abed is Donabedian, who is a pioneer in the uh, quality care. So he has given a structural and classical approach for developing measures. Structure and process equal to outcome. So this is about, this is what we are intent to do. Next one. So there could be some structural issues like manpower, tracing, policies, etc. There should be some process like compliance, timeliness, equity, or there should be some outcome like mortality rate, patient satisfactions, and efficiency and all. So either way you can concentrate on this. Okay, are you clear now? Next. So this is your task. So I have given some uh, minor three clinical audits topics here. Identify below parameters corresponds either it corresponds to the structure or correspond to the process or correspond to the outcome. Okay. The first one is patient satisfied with current pain relief. Patient getting satisfied. Our audit we have done some pain management. 
and they got satisfied the intervention with the managerial way which we are doing that and they are satisfied the pain relief okay there's a topic so in what way it concentrates structure process or outcome louder please outcome Ex uh, excellent okay so this audit is concentrating uh, concentrating on the outcome of the patient safety measures right next one is so we have to give aspirin for uh, ama patients during the discharge aspirin not could be any other um, i mean any other dax okay so where does we concentrate on this structure process or outcome this is process excellent okay i think you are much better than now right and the next one is availability of electronic clinical informations structure so now you got a clear idea about that what is the structure what is the process and what is the outcome so the clinical audit concentrate on either one of this okay amenable changes very important amenable changes without this you cannot have the clinical audit okay next one next very important what is the standard 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 we have lot of standards we have standards for nabl we have standards for nabh we have standard for iso so many standards are that what that standards refers to in clinical audit a standard refers to in the clinical audit is the level of care to be achieved for any particular criterion standard equal to criterion plus target what is the criterion the statement of what is being measured so what you are going to measure that is called as criterion and what is the target it is target is a numerical way of expression it is expressed as a percentage of undefined level of performance considered acceptable in relation to the chosen criterion everything is there in your handouts i mean which i have given okay so this you have to understand this is a very very important thing this is a um, uh, um, uh, basic thing which you have to understand about the standard a standard is nothing but a component of criterion and target what is the criterion the one what you have to measure and target what you have to measure is expressed in the numerical form science when it is not expressed mathematically is not a science it is a philosophy okay you have to express science in the mathematical way say it could be a unit say it could be a number say it could be a percentage okay then only it is science okay same is applied for the clinical audit so whatever the science has mathematical is the express language of the science okay so you have to express your cl clinical audit in numbers okay here target refers to the percentage so you have you understood about the standard standard is the criterion and target next one now how to set the standard so, um, you have to you have to use a smart goals like you had it should be specific it should be measurable of course then only you can measure the standard and it should be agreeable and it should be re relevant and it should be theoretically sound it should be theoretically sound so which means that it can implement it and in enhance one of the process of the clinical audit right next okay so let us see the example 95% of children referred to the department will seen by a member of the team within 2 weeks of the referral being received here 95 percentage refers to the what is the numerical expression numerical expression is the clinical audit's targets okay so the target is 95 percentage the target may be anything which you are setting for yourself it could be 80 percentage it could be more than 80 percentage it 100 percentage don't keep it as 100 percentage because that is practically impossible even though it is possible during the re-audit it may be declined okay it is not uh, it is more arbitrary so make it as 90 or 95 90 is uh, much uh, acceptable okay so 95 percent here refer the 95 percent refer to the target and children refer to the department will be seen by a member of the team within two weeks of the referral being received is the criterion so the uh, the components of the standards are target and criterion the target is numerical way and the criterion what we are measuring right next so how to write an audit standard so now you are familiar with some of the basic components about the standards what is the standard what is the how to derive the standards and what the structural process and outcome now you are going to write a standard for your own department okay so for example you have to select a topic i have given some clinical side leg ulcers you want to reduce the leg ulcers okay so to improve the care received by the patient with leg ulcers the patient with having the venous ulcer or any static ulcer you have to en enhance the care that is your intention that is your aim objective then what should be your objective to ensure the leg ulcer are treated appropriately so you have to set the standards what is the percentage you have to concentrate here we have put as 95 percentage of venous ulcer will be treated with graduate graduated multi-layer high pressure bandaging so 95 percent is the target the other, the, the, the other one is a criterion. Okay. So there, there may be some exceptions. We are not going deep into the through and through that. 
so this is how we have to write the standards okay the standard while while deriving the target the target is totally you can take the freedom of i mean uh, yourself for setting the targets say it could be 80 percentage uh, 90 percentage 90 percentage etc right next one so you have to set your own raw data sheets so you have the idea of the patient what age and sex venous ulcer and how how how, how much it has been intervened and your um, uh, data analysis this is as simple as this okay next so that is now is you have to compare the test results with the existing standard okay suppose if the standard is 80 percent test there is some adequacy in the process okay there is some adequacy in the process where you have to really really concentrate on the process and you have to enhance the patient care you got the idea then you have to implement the changes the changes you have to implement either within the department or interdepartmental or multidisciplinary or cross-sectional okay so you have to collide with the other department you have to collide with other doctors staff nurses even you have totally you have to integrate with the other department for enhancing the quality okay so that is how you have to implement so you have to give proper training you have to uh, give, give proper adequate sensitization you have to give proper adequate resource materials for them and there should be some kind of uh, mutual understanding that is very important it's not just like that i am saying you are doing like that okay you should have a congenial way of implementing the topic okay next follow up based on the standards this is the result and after that followed by re-audit next is you have to so once the standard is completed we have to do again a re-audit after a, a specific defined time then re-audit to ensure the adherence of the practice to the set of the standards so when it is okay then okay so you have concluded something you have derived something you have implemented and the one the, the take home message have been taken by the across the hospitals and the clinical audit is a successful audit you got the point next so re-audit is followed by PDC, PDCA cycle. Plan, do, check and act. Okay. So what is the critical, now you have to do the critical appraisal of the audit. So benefits to the patients based on the clinical audit, what are the benefits to the patients? What are the benefits to the ward staffs? What are the benef benefits to the hospital? What are the benefits to the community? So this is what we have intended to, we have to do that. Next one. Is the clinical audit and clinical research are the same? No. The research involves experiment based on hypothesis, systematic investigations, involved experiments, includes novel treatment, includes extensive statistic, statistical data analysis, and the results of clinical research can be generalized and published. Okay. But the clinical audit involves measuring against pre existing standards, systematic, systematic review of practice limited statistical evaluation and the results are only relevant to concerned institutional practice you cannot generalize your practice to other hospitals okay so it is containing pertaining to a hospital only you can set it for 80 percent of clinical critical alert has to be informed to the other um, department has to be intervened that is your standards my standard my hospital standard is something different it can be less than that also it can be more than that also so it is pertaining different to the practice which you are following it cannot be generalized like your research topic so that is a very important uh, issue about the Clinical audit. Next. Does clinical audit topic needs ethical committee approval? I said already. No. Does not need ethical committee approval, but others to abide to ethical network uh, framework. Clinical audit refers to specific activity that measures existing clinical care against, again, and again, selling the same thing, again, existing standards. Next. Uh, we are coming to the very interesting um, topic that is thank you so i got i thought you got an interesting idea and uh, some take home message from today's topic okay so about clinical audit the my first half hour is over i'm just i'm i'm just listening right now i i'll just uh, separate this into four teams actually there are four one two three and four okay so i given a handout of uh, 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 it's a rough data sheets it's um, it's unfilled one okay you choose a clinical audit you choose a clinical audit on your based on microbiology. Okay, you can select a you based on your gap analysis or based on uh, 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 any recommendations based on ionic guidelines or based on uh, anything. I can give a clue. For example, uh, how long you have to follow the surgical site infection for processes? What's the duration? How many days you have to follow? Processes, implantation, surgical site infections. Sorry. How many days? 90. 
yeah exactly okay so you can put okay so more than 90 percentage or more than 100 percentage has to follow uh, the surgical site infections follow for the patients like that okay or anything pertaining to microbiology so you have to select the choose you have to choose the topic from your own uh, based on your own expertise and experiences on your own department okay so uh, i mean uh, uh, hand out for you so you just take the first one talk evaluate the topic right the evaluation of the topic write the uh, name of the topic you just uh, write the name of the topic and just fill up the question app and write uh, whether it involves the structure process or outcome you got it next page just turn out you write who could be your audit lead the audit lead is a person who compile and analyzes the data <clears throat> derive interpretation concludes observations suggest recommendations for implementation and the review so the audit lead is a person who navigates the journey and the next one is audit team members they collect the data <coughs> with the recommended format reporting to the lead auditor communicate any deviations to the lead auditor suggesting inputs to enhance the process just like professor associate professor assistant professor like kind of okay so they will collect the data they will they will inform the lead auditor so they will they will be the liaison between the lead auditor and the end users so you have to select your team members and background based on what background you are selecting the topic there should be some background you write, just write some few lines about the background followed by what is the aim of the topic what is the objectives of your clinical audit followed by standards next comes is a very important point the crux of the clinical audit so what is the standard which you are setting up okay something uh, this much of percentage is doing this much okay followed by methodology and results now we can get the results and conclusions and re audit followed by you have to do re audit the rough data sheets i have given so the re audit has to be done as per the format so based on the re audit so what are the critical appraisal you are getting the results um, uh, the benefits to the patients benefit to the team benefit to the hospital benefit to the community so we have to conclude with the re audit we have to conclude with the beneficiaries okay so that completes the clinical audit so uh, the agenda as per the agenda i hope i have created some kind of awareness about the clinical audit some kind of interest on the clinical audit how now it is reciprocation from your end you just take some few minutes uh, you can take some 10 minutes okay you select the topic you can browse your uh, uh, google search and you can select the topic you just fill it up the form any one of your team representative can come and present over your topic and we will appraise your topic and that ends today's uh, session now your session starts you can discuss four members you can discuss and you can select the clinical audit topic so if you have some kind of doubt just you can raise your hands i am ready to clarify you Thank you. 
So the NABS fifth edition mandates every department has to do some two clinical audits. Every department, there should basically one clinical audit has to be done.
Okay. Uh, yeah, we are. We have to finish it off because uh, fifteen minutes more. So we have to strictly adhere to the timings. I am very particular about that. So for the next, you have any lecture? So for the next session, two things are very adequate: your interest and your glucose level. So it should not go low, go down, right? So try to complete. finish okay now we can start the discussion from your end so you are going to uh, dominate the stage right now so who has finished please come and present please please come over here one of the representative of your team please come so we are here to help you please please come here so otherwise it not be visible right okay you can sir anger in the very much inga varu Please come, come over here. So I'm always with you. Come. My God, if you handle it, then I will do it. Sorry, sir. It's a little length, but it's a front length. So now, what's your name, doctor? Doctor Bailey, sir. Doctor? Bailey from which college? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, Dr. Velbiri is going to. Dr. Velbiri is going to talk about the uh, main topic. Oh dear. Live streaming. Okay. 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 Yeah. Dr. Velbiri is going to present about our clinical audit. Yes, doctor. So, what's your topic? Fantastic. Can see the audience and tell. Okay. Fantastic. So, where you are concentrating? Structure, process, or outcome? process fantastic okay so your audit will be selected and your audit will be you no know, based on your uh, recommendation so your audit will be recommended for uh, for the procedures okay so what is your uh, uh, who is the audit lead my audit lead is senior chief medical officer okay fantastic who is your audit team members that's excellent they are the one who is to collect all the data and going to uh, submit you so the background you have said already so what is the aim and objective Yeah, that's a great way of doing that. Next, what is your standard? What you have set rate? Uh, I have set rate for the five minutes of hand hygiene. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the standard for the response. When does this is a criterion? So, what is the target? The standard means target and criterion. Yeah. Oh, ninety. You you tell any one number. Say it could be ninety five percentage of the 
staff members should be adequately treated for hand hygiene. So that is the set rate standard. Okay, so you have to collect the data. So based on the data, you have to do the clinical audit, and next you have to do the re-audit. So who are the beneficiaries for your audit? Beneficiaries are patients. Definitely, you know the no so healthcare workers definitely and. Yeah. Yeah, result after finishing that you have to do the result and based on the result you have to recommend. Okay, so if your audit is successful, you have to recommend. So 95, all the staff has to be uh, go, go for hand hygiene practices rigorously. You have to use all the ways of monitoring them, all the ways of, ways of sensitizing them, all the ways of uh, uh, doing the needful, right? Thank you very much. I, I, I think we can give her a good uh, applause. Fantastic. There's the best way of uh, presenting a clinical audit. Now you got a complete idea. I mean, the crux of the clinical audit. The next team, please come. Either from this end. Anyone? I'm having all the mics over my hand. I want to share it with somebody else, right? Please come in. So this is your session. You have to come and present, please. Yes, sir. What's your name, doctor? Praveen. From? Praveen. From? Uh, Tanjav Medical. Uh, yeah, Dr. Praveen Kumar from Tanjav Medical College is going to present this clinical audit. Uh, say your topic and. Local sanitation guidelines for hand hygiene. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That's a very interesting topic then. National clinical. National clinical guidelines. Yes. Is the problem amenable to change? Yes. The patient's anonymity maintained? Yes. Uh, my present clinical audit is based on outcome. Background uh, treatment of asymptomatic bacteria and to prevent uh, pyelonephritis in pregnancy. To ensure the proper guidelines followed uh, regarding sample collection and processing and uh, lab reporting and uh, to achieve the maximum target of 90 to 95 percent. What is your standard? What is the standard of the clinic law? What is the standard of What is the clinic based on? What is the difference of the clinic law? Is there any international guidelines or any research methodologies or any recommendations? What basis you are doing this clinic law? SOP based on the SOP followed in our laboratory. So there should be some gap in your practice. So you are following that. So what is the standard? Uh, what is the standard you have said? 90, 95%. 95% is of? 95% yes. target population. Target. Pregnant, pregnant patients. Yes, symptomatic bacteria. 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 So, there is a standard. You have to do the who are the Yeah, sure. Yeah, good morning. What's your name, doctor? 
Okay. Intensive care, prevalence. I think this is, uh, you know, what I can say is much more research topic. Aspergillosis in intensive care. Most immunocompromised patients will be having aspergillosis. Okay. So what is your standards you have set then? So when you do your prevalence study and incidence study, that is most into the research topic. But anyhow, I'll just clarify it to you. What is the standard you have set, right? Eighty-five percentage of. Okay. 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 You have to start analyzing this. Okay, for all the intensive care units. Obviously, you have to do that. Okay, but uh, I think this this comes under much more into the research one because you are measuring something what uh, you have to intervene. Okay, so what is the component of your clinical audit? Structure, process, or outcome? So, what is the outcome? Will be the what? What could be the outcome? What is the anticipated outcome of the topic? Okay, I can understand. No, you want to know about the aspergillosis status of the intensive care patients. Okay, so in that case, what I can suggest is you can you can rewrite your standards like most of the. Uh, all uh, most vulnerable patients who are the vulnerable patients for aspergillosis okay uh, you mean uh, immunocompromised patients uncontrolled diabetes mellitus or any crescent sign i think it's crescent sign which you have seen in the x-ray right and uh, so those are all the patients which you have to collect the samples for doing the aspergillosis test and you have to give the do the further analysis okay so you have to select like that you can do if you do the prevalence then it is coming under research okay you have to go for ethical clearance or not so this is putting the other way around so more, almost all the vulnerable patients has to be screened for aspergillosis and you have to do that and have to revise and you have to increase the outcome in the icu units okay thank you doctor thank you so last team So what's your name, Doctor? KPV. Sample? Sample collection for blood collection. Uh, this is a little bit hazy. Can you just refine this? Okay. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, okay. So you're just concentrating on the um, uh, quality of the samples have been collected from the sample collection area. You're doing the audit. So so uh, almost all the um, uh, questionnaires is fit into the clinical audit. Everything is yes, 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 except the first one, which is no, then followed by your background. So based on the background, what is your, your research? I mean, your uh, uh, your clinical audit based on whether it is based on some international guidelines or nice or Scottish or anything. Mm. Yeah, that could be the impact. OK, so where you are concentrating structure, process or outcome? Process. You are concentrating on the process. What is the standard you have set rate for this study? Okay. What is the standard criteria? More than more than ninety percentage of sample should be collected in an acceptable way. So we have NABL criteria of accepting the samples and rejection sample rejection criteria and all. Okay. So this is very really important. And mostly you have to if you are doing like that, you have to concentrate on the pediatrics ward, pediatric and NICU where there is insufficient number of samples and where there will be less number of integrated samples and all. So we can still refine your study into like that also. Okay. So more than 90% of the samples should be collected in a much more uh, acceptable way rather than rejection criteria should be very, very less than if it is not 90% what are the target persons? What you have to do for implementing the quality of the sample collections? So what is the plan of actions for that? 
definitely you have to one you have to give training next you have to see the technical aspects of that okay any issues with the sample collection in the i mean uh, um, tubes they are using okay uh, those things also you have to look after and uh, attrition rate of the nurses will also will also have an impact over that okay newly come nurses will have very less experiences and all long term nurses will have a good kind of exposure of sample collection these are the attributes which can give uh, directly impact your sample collection so you have to based on the data collection you will be getting all these derivations so based on the derivations you have to give training you have to give adequate uh, handouts and whatever may be and follow that you have to do re audit based on the re audit you have to enhance okay so if there is some some gap in the first standard you have to enhance the standards and you have to recommend that some recommendations okay so either the attrition date for the attrition date in the nicu should be limited and uh, for the pediatric should be limited because new staffs will have difficult kind of uh, collecting the samples and all these are the concluding remarks and recommendations you can give throughout the hospital so that is the very purpose of doing the clinical audit so this is very sensible clinical audit i appreciate for selecting the topic thank you very much thank you so now we are coming coming exactly one hour okay so we are just abiding to the time uh abiding to the uh, protocols and agenda the agenda now it is i think it is pretty clear so everybody has to have some kind of i have a kindle interest on each and every one i hope i have done some justification for that i am i am right so good that's that's the very purpose of doing the clinical audit and you got some basic ideas about that and you have presented explicitly you no know, uh, really really well and uh, for thanks for coming forward and uh, giving your uh, uh, i mean ideologies even i got some new points from Uh, um, from your uh, um, topics, okay. So that is a better way of exchanging the ideas, and that is a that is the best way of exchanging the quality also. And uh, with that, I'll just conclude my uh, clinical audit roles and responsibilities. This is a generalized topic. You can do any clinical audit in any department, okay. But the main part is implementation, which is really really challenge, which I have based on my own experience. I can say you cannot go and directly. call a cardiac surgeon and do implement the changes that's a force field analysis we have to do lots and lots of nitty gritty things also there this sheet seems to be very simple the pro this pro protocol is also seems to be very simple when you happen to implement then you can find the real heat of doing the clinical audit okay but that is not the purpose the purpose is to enhance the either structure process and outcome thank you very much all of you please complete your feedback and return to us thank you thank you all Thank you, sir, for such an informative and interactive session. May I request Dr. Anupriya, ma'am, Professor, Department of Microbiology, to honor our speaker with a memento. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Our so again, I just want to thank you all. Uh, thank you for the organizers, uh, Dr. Chitra, uh, madam, and uh, uh, Dr. Dinesh, who who helped me a lot since from uh, yesterday. He, he just followed up. Dr. Vallab, who gave a phenomenal support for uh, making this happen, and Dr. Dr. Diego. I think he is very familiar during the time of COVID. We used to see all his. Uh, uh facebook kind of uh, awareness program uh, over there i used to tell he's from our college only and thank you all for uh, your kind support thank you very much thank you sir for your compliments our next speaker mr suda will be engaging us online ma'am ma'am did her undergraduate from anamalai university she also completed mba in hospital administration Ma'am received international fellowship in health technology assessment from IIT Madras and World Health Organization. She is selected as a certified professional in hospital infection control practices, both basic and advanced, by the consortium of accredited healthcare organization. Currently, Ma'am has been working as an independent consultant under NABH, NABL, and NABB. Ma'am, may I request Mrs. Suda to give a talk on risk assessment tools and technique? Over to you, Ma'am. 
Thank you, Doctor, for that introduction. Very good morning, all of you. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Ma Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. You are audible. Yeah. On the outset, I would like to thank Trichy uh, SR Medical uh, College and uh, Hospital and Research Center, uh, especially uh, the top management and the lab team for uh, organizing this and having invited me. Probably I am the only odd man out here. I am a non-doctor. Uh, and I am sure this topic is definitely going to be a very important topic for all of us. So can I'm just sh sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Is it in full screen? The background, this I'm one able one to listen to some music. Thing. That can be cut out. There is a background music that is going on. It's actually disturbing. Background music. I'll switch it off, ma'am. If you start talking, that will stop. Ma'am, uh, yeah, I can see a PPT, but it is not on full screen. Is it on full screen now? Yes, ma'am. Now it is on full screen. Yes, please carry on. Now. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is this is uh, probably this may not be a clinical topic, but however, uh, this has been applied across the different verticals in the uh, you know in different industries, including the aeronautic industries, uh, you know, uh, the space, and other industries have been applying this for quite some time. Uh, for Fortunately, we are also lucky enough to upload these techniques in the last uh, one decade. So, so today's topic we will, and more and more thanks to these accreditation programs like NABL, NABL, JCI, where they enforce a lot of um, a lot of uh, insistence. There is a lot of insistence in implementation of this risk case, risk assessment uh, using proper tools and techniques. So. The moment we say we are accredited or we are going for accreditation, it doesn't mean that we are error-free or we are risk-free environment. But, but what it does is it helps us to you know, identify proactively these risks so that we could prevent them from recurring. Right? So we all know that there are a lot of interconnected processes um, that are available in our hospital. Uh, and these every activity every flow has some risk or the other which is prevalent in every department for that for that matter and we all all these days we used to uh, you know uh, do a post incident analysis but now we are going to talk more about the proactive risk assessment and how do we prevent from that from happening so how do we start any accreditation please so we all normally have a happy beginning. The moment we say we are going to start with this NABH accreditation or NABL, we are very happy and we beautifully start, right? There is a small video that talks about it. So when we start the accreditation programs, we meticulously, we become very sincere. I mean, we track all these errors. And things seem very well. I'm sure you all would agree that when we initially start our accreditation process, 
we meticulously track these quality indicators we track these risks we you know we properly uh, do the incident reporting and all but when it gets speeded up the more and more sample size we need we need to start tracking most of it is under the carpet i'm sure you all would agree right so most incidents after we come to know of the incidents many times it get analyzed but most of the times it is under the carpet and if this is going to be the case then uh, what about those incidents which are not even notified to us right now i have a question to all of you how many incidents happen in your department on an average every day can somebody answer can somebody uh, pass the mic so that i can just at least listen roughly each team can you give me a number yes ma'am can you hear me yes yes i'm able to hear the, we don't each have a wireless team. mic ma'am so somebody has right. to walk up to me and answer if they wish to interact with you okay okay fine they can just call out any numbers they are able to say yes ma'am so so how how many how many risks do you think each department has <clears throat> participants please participate pere participants now you have to participate so roughly how many incidents happen in every department what was their answer just give me a rough number i'll in your microbiology one. department one incident every day one of the participants is one incident per day or per month per day one incident okay yes ma'am that's the answer great great so how many risks do they think uh, every every day they there could be in their department okay now the same person can answer how many risks yeah yeah yes just give me a random number you said uh, incident 1 you said so risk you also tell me 5 ha huh? okay 5 he says 5 man okay so i'm sure there could be hundreds of risks in every department unless it is really analyzed so unfortunately we don't have meticulous systems to do all these proactive analysis which is why we need to have proper tools and we need to be oriented on how to utilize these tools so that we are able to identify these risks in any of the department for that matter so as somebody rightly said there could be numbers thankfully at least we we did not we did not hear that there were there are zero incidents in the department so definitely more than one incident in any department is what we uh, we see right this is excluding the near misses that we see in each department there are a lot of near misses that happens every day someone or the other prevents that from landing up into an incident do you all agree so i'm assuming you are all nodding your heads you are all saying a big s so there are a lot of near misses that happens and that doesn't mean that we do, if there are no incidents in your department that doesn't mean that your department is risk free error free or you know your department is the safest place uh, to work in the hospital that doesn't really uh, indicate that so unless we really do a proper reporting or tracking right most often we say uh, that we have 1% of errors or one error happening every day which we may think that it is very negligible but unfortunately it it cannot be you know it, uh, we can't take it for granted in a setup uh, where uh, the patient's life does matter so this 1% or one number in a department every day could be catastrophic right so it is very essential for the patient for the family and for the reputation of the organization as well so this one person also needs to be addressed so what we are talking is only about the post incident analysis right so i am able to hear the music of actually i'll see to it ma'am i'll see to it yeah you please carry on ma'am i'll see to it yeah 
so this one person what we are talking about is doing a proper uh, root cause analysis taking appropriate actions but what about those risk which has which is not visible to us which has not been projected to us or which we might have not noticed right so those also needs to be uh, you know taken care of so what do you do when you ent encounter an incident in your department we not we normally take actions isn't it so can somebody tell me what are the actions you take in 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 your department yes, audience, when you find an incident when you have an incident or when you see that there is a non compliance i'm sure many of you are coming from a any bill accredited setup right so the moment you say you have an incident so what do you do after that you do a root cause analysis after that what do you do you take any actions yes so what what are the different types of actions you take Sorry, ma'am. What did you say? Give so find do the root cause analysis and do the training. That's the answer. So, what is our training? Uh, what is our terminology called? Have you heard of this term? Correction. Corrective action. So can somebody tell me what is the difference between correction corrective action you all would have heard a lot about kappa so what is correction what is corrective action for every you say training should be given for any incident you take the final action would be training right so and we 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 just fill the training papers and we just close the incident or we just close the non compliance so that's not factually right it's about how you do a proper root cause analysis and identify the root cause and then you take action so can somebody tell me the definition of correction and corrective action unless we understand these basics we may not be able to move to the actual risk assessment so what is correction yes please explain what is correction ma'am is asking the difference between corrective action and correction suppose there is a sample collection error so you do a proper root cause analysis and do a correction corrective action isn't it so what is correction what is corrective action what is preventive action how do you actually close it <clears throat> assume there is a wrong sample wrong patient wrong sample please somebody i know it's difficult to interact from being online yes. but i request one of the participants at least to ma'am is asking uh, see this is she's giving you a situation wrong sample wrong patient now what is your corrective action and what is the correction you will ask to collect the sample again so that is correction or corrective action so ma'am she says it is correction she'll ask to uh, collect the sample again which is correction and what will your co corrective action be just for that one sample yes so she says for, uh, for for all the further samples she will cross check that is corrective okay. action okay fine so the, let's be very clear about these definitions the moment you encounter any incident or any non compliance we do a proper root cause analysis using various tools and techniques that are available the one like the the five way analysis or the ishikawa there are so many tools that are available once you do a proper root cause analysis then you get into the action right there are three types of actions one is correction corrective action preventive action all these things so what is correction correction is something that you do instantly to patch up that particular situation like ma'am said what do we do if there is a long a wrong patient wrong sample you need to recollect it isn't it again collect the sample from the same patient 
that would be the correction but does that solve your error from not recurring certainly not isn't it you are just patching up for that particular moment so what do you do you have done a proper root cause analysis and then having found out the actual root cause for that you need to take the action maybe the person who is collected is not adequately trained you know to check for the right um, the double identifiers or the whether the trf and the patient name matches all these things or maybe the labeling is wrong what where is that particular person who has made the mistake lacking so identifying that root cause and training them will be your corrective action fixing it permanently in other local terms let's yes we can hear you ma'am sir i am i am uh, i am i am able to hear uh, some other uh, talk no nobody is talking here we are all completely silent no that welcome speech is coming sir in between hmm. okay so um, correction ma'am the recorded uh, speech is coming sir recorded speech sir adam play aa raha hai morning welcome speech is coming. Okay, okay. Let me no, check. Okay. So, uh, please carry on, ma'am. We'll check it. No, it is actually hindering. I'm not able to. so the correction is something that is done uh, correction is something that is done instantly to patch up for that particular moment corrective action is something that is done after doing a proper root cause analysis right after that we normally also talk about preventive action isn't it so actually it is it's hindering i'm unable to talk i'm i think you are watching the uh, program on youtube can you check it ma'am can you check yes, your phone or your laptop no sir if your youtube tab is on probably that is causing any some trouble because here everything else is clear ma'am fine sir okay so um so correction corrective action followed by we normally say kapa corrective action and preventive action isn't it now there is nothing called preventive action now we have moved on to risk management so there is no more preventive action terminology that will be used in any of these accreditations now we are going to talk it as call it as proactive risk assessment followed by risk management right so what is risk assessment we all know the definition Yes, definition of risk assessment. Someone, please answer. Right, we have a quick video. So that's the simplest way of uh, defining a risk assessment. A systematic process of evaluating the potential risk that may be involved in a projected activity or undertaking. so normally we think all these uh, jargons are very very complicated and we all think that oh it's going to be rocket science but it's all common sense and what we apply in day to day life right so but in fact we can't do it very very uh, locally we have to apply certain tools and techniques like how tom does now so he is able to identify the risk he is analyzing the risk and he is able to evaluate risk as well and of course play safe 
So this is what we call it as meticulous way of using the tools and techniques so that we are on the safer side, right? So we, uh, what is the primary difference between a risk assessment and root cause analysis, right? FMEA is one of the tools that we use that is a very common tool, very easy to use tool uh, that we normally, uh, you know, uh, apply for doing a risk assessment. So primarily when we do uh, either the risk assessment and the root cause analysis, the differences are these. So risk assessment, we do it proactively, whereas RCAs are retrospective. After an incident happens, we do the RCA, whereas this FMEA or HERA, the health hazard, health hazard identification, you know, so all these tools, we do it proactively even before any incident happens, right? So it helps us to identify and address problems before they occur. These address problems after they occur. FMEA is not done by a single person or the HOD or the quality manager, poor thing, um, you know, just before the assessment. It has to be done by a multidisciplinary committee or a team so that all, every input is included in the um, risk assessment. Whereas the RCA team may not engage the entire lot. A few things could even be confidential. So uh, so there is a particular small team which are who are directly involved with the um, incident. Only those people will be engaged for the analysis. Here we can choose a topic but here it is based on the incident. This is the primary difference between the proactive risk assessment and post-incidental root cause analysis. So we should uh, clearly buy, bifurcate and both are essential. So if an incident happens, we need to know how to do a root cause analysis, take actions. We also need to know how to do a proactive risk assessment using tools and techniques like FMEA and take actions based on the priority. Right. So why do we do all these proactive risk assessment? Though a lot of incidents are reported, a lot of errors are reported. Uh, many, as we already said, are under the carpet. We really do not know how much have actually landed up. And we often try to ignore or we try to lie low. Um, the moment we don't see any incident happening, we say uh, 40 years it's been there. So nothing has happened. Let's see when it happens, then we will take action is what we all have as an attitude. So that should change because if an error, if, a, if an incident happens, if it breaks as a major catastrophe, then everything is lost. So we need to proactively take also. That's the reason a lot of, a lot of percentages where we see a lot of, you know, a preventive actions needs to be taken has landed up into the proactive risk assessment today. So this we have copied from various in industries, including the aeronautics and uh, airline industry, where it is all meticulously um, done uh, using the checklist and you have multiple controls established to prevent errors. We're going to talk a lot about these controls. Any preventive tools that you know of other than the FMEA? Yes. Any proactive, <clears throat> proactive risk assessment tool that somebody can take? Yes, someone can answer. Yes, please be loud. Mike, Mike. Any Checklist verification. That's one answer, ma'am. Okay. Any other tools, ma'am? Any other tools? Checklist verification is a control. Anything else? Okay. The most common would be uh, the FMEA or the HERA, right? HERA is very, very common. So that also can be applied. But this FMEA gives a lot of insight and we get into the details, right? So we are going to pick and choose this particular tool. I'm going to, I won't be able to take all the tools, but I thought this is the most common tool that many hospitals use, many industries use, uh, because precisely this is close to, you know, uh, very close in identifying the risks. So 
let's talk about fmba failure mode and effect analysis most often most of the time people think that failure mode effect analysis means that after the failure has happened right that's not the case this is a tool that that tells us what could go wrong why would the failure happen and what would be the effect if it happens that's primarily the analysis that we are going to see here right so when will you use it for analyzing failures proactively what has a high impact or happens often how could you improve the process or sometimes even the workplace redesign can happen based on the fmea it is not only for every process you can do the risk assessment for each of your process in your microbiology department or any department for that matter or you can even conduct a random facility round inside your laboratory and list out all the points and for each of those you can again identify the risks or you can select any topic it need not be the same process it need not be uh, the facility it can even be pertaining to the staff that are available in your uh, department if you want to conduct the risk factors risk factors per se does not uh, indicate only the health factor it could be lack of training it could be unskilled staff it could be untrained staff it could be you know non unqualified staff or it could be inadequate staff there could be different factors uh, you know around the staff management isn't it so you can take topics pertaining to these or you could select equipment related failure mode effect analysis you could take reagent related effect uh, you know or you can say his related failure mode effective analysis what could go wrong if this system fails or this group of personnel fail or if this supply fails so you can do it anyway it is not like you have to only pick and choose your process flow chart and you have to do so you can apply it uh, based on your need so how do you do it so it has evolved across a different industries and what i'm going to show you today is more of hfmea so healthcare failure mode effect analysis so do you all have have you all received the material do you all have the sheets with you yes, yes they do have ma'am they have received the sheets right this is something which you will not find on the net okay um the what you will find on the net is applicable for other industries you may not find the uh, range of this 0 to 10 scale for a healthcare industry whatever we have shared is exclusively for healthcare which was defined by our qci right so this is a very good tool that you can apply and it is standardized and you can use it in your hospital so what are we doing going to do step 1 will be to define the topic what is my requirement where am i going to do the risk assessment which is the process for which i am going to do the risk assessment maybe it could be for the covid test alone or you want to do something pertaining to hiv test or you want to do something about the surveillance or it need not be even clinical it could be a non clinical topic that you want to choose as i already mentioned it could be related to staff it could be related to environment it could be related to budget for microbiology or it could be related to infrastructural maintenance anything so first of all define the topic right define the topic and then assemble the team it cannot be one single person sitting across the table to just jot down the points it's, it's definitely going to be biased so this this entire process should be done as a team that's very very important unless it is done as a team it's definitely going to be a one person's perspective and it, the it's going to be again a complete failure of the entire exercise once you assemble the team you have defined the topic then you describe the process you describe the process in consonance with the team you list out from the beginning to the last right how does the patient enter or how does the sample enter your department say for example if you want to do the um, risk assessment or uh, for collection of sample a microbiological sample right right from your trf till you process your sample and you release your report until it is dispatched just try to list out the entire process entire step 
right it could be broader broader steps that you want to mention or you can even make it into a little more detailed also right the minor steps or the smaller steps also you can put in the advantage of putting these smaller steps as part of the process is that if there is going to be redundancy or if there is going to be duplication or if it's going to really increase the risk for a patient by adding two more steps then you can might as well tweak your process this really helps you to streamline your existing process as well and sometimes you may see that the process flow is in such a way that it is zigzag the step which should be done the previously has been tweaked and it becomes two steps later because of which there is a problem that is created to the patient it could be you know uh, it could be an error that could be caused something like that so you can tweak all these process when you are realigning your process or your topic then what do you do you list out the possible causes possible failures possible uh, effects all those are listed and then you start giving the course which we are going to see all now right finally you identify the actions to be taken and measure the outcomes try to put in controls so these are broadly the first step. first you define the topic assemble the team describe the re describe the process right explicitly put down the process as much as possible in detail then conduct the analysis on where you could go wrong and what could go wrong and finally you give the scorings and try to analyze the risk priority number based on the matrix that is available that is given to you right we are going to now see how you do this step 1 define the topic we have spoken about this now so must be you you must be able to first of all prioritize on the topic so take the topic which is very essential very critical which could land up uh, into a bigger issue or which could save the patient or uh, which has you uh, and the numbers could be uh, more for that particular you know topic or it could be a real real uh, risk that is prevalent in your department so select a topic in such a manner and must not be overly complex or uh you know too many sub processes don't try to link too many things into that focus on your topic right and this this structure i'm sure you all have the material with you the headings the steps in the process the failure mode what could go wrong failure causes why would the failure happen failure effects likelihood detection severity risk priority number and the risk level so i am not going to talk this first let us focus on the focus on this steps in the process so this is how you start listing the steps in the process say for example receive the samples with label and grf is my first step the second step is to check the acceptance and rejection criteria note down the test required and time of receipt in label or in trf just excuse me um so uh, sorry acceptance rejection criteria then you note down the test required and uh, time of uh, receipt in label or in trf so like this you whatever you have it as a process flow chart you try to list it out in the steps as steps in the process right you could do this or you can just randomly go around your uh, microbiology department or your lab and see what all is wrong with your department so the fire alarm light is not blinking or the ground floor pharmacy cramped exit or this is like this is not specific to lab i've just put it uh, this is a common template so uh, the fire fighting equipments adequacy in the outer areas is not there or the signage is near the cameras and lifts are not proper the narcotic cupboard key uh, kept in the drawer maybe you can you can identify some things uh, which are not uh, you know safe inside the microbiology department or your laboratory and list out those observations and try to identify the failure as well right this also can be done now let's quickly try right to list out the process right the, um, all the teams we request you to do it as a team 
right? Each team can either list out one or two process. Just have one or two lines alone. You don't have to put the entire process. Maybe later you can do it, right? Just list out the process or if you want to identify the risk, that also can be done. I'll just give you three minutes time. Can you all please list out? Sir, are, have they started, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am, they're doing it. Are you able to write? Yes. Yeah. Can we discuss? <clears throat> Is it enough time? Shall we discuss? Need time, ma. No time, main ma'am. Ma'am, they need another okay, two more okay. minutes. Yeah, yeah. Just one or two uh, steps alone, like this. Receive the samples with label and tape. Just don't copy the same thing. Or you can choose any safety related or you can choose something related to your staff or chemical or equipment in your department. Are we done? Yes, ma'am. Some of them have finished. <clears throat> can we start discussing? Yes. If someone wants to come and discuss, please, you can come here so that ma'am can also hear you. You can directly interact with ma'am. Come, come, come. Yes. One of the participants are coming, ma'am. You can directly yes. talk to them. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Please go ahead, sir. Our, our topic is biomedical waste management, ma'am. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. The failure so, mode, the improper segregation, ma'am. No, no. I don't want you to go to the failure mode and all. I just wanted you to list out the process alone. The first step alone, I want to list out. Okay. Process. Say, for example... Fantastic. You have chosen a topic of biomedical waste. So under biomedical waste, 
when sub, assuming you are going on round on a biomedical waste management protocols check are you going to do it for the entire hospital or are you doing it within your department in our department only ma'am in your department okay yes. fantastic so what are the things that you observe during your uh, um, you know during your uh, rounds yeah proper segregation of uh, waste ma'am okay proper segregation of waste then what are the other points that you would like to see so adequacy of bins okay so yeah, yeah adequacy of bins and proper segregation of waste and uh, great what else we will check sir and uh, a percentage of uh, waste that produced okay Anything. so you are doing so let's not complicate uh, let's yes. you are doing a biomedical waste management audit in your department what all would you check will you see whether it is placed in an appropriate position yes ma'am yes positioning of your biomedical waste bins do you see whether there is any poster yeah ma'am Yes, that we can have be to one check of for the. Yes, sir. So yeah, color coded poster. Fantastic color coded poster because it is as per the law that we need to have a poster next to your bin. What else do you check? Do you check for the biomedical stickers, biohazard stickers? Yes, ma'am. On the so, dustbin? Yes, whether that is available. Then what else, sir? Whether color covers are available correctly? sometimes there could be shortage of covers so whether adequate covers are available adequate bins are available do you check all those things yes ma'am and a proper uh, removal uh, a timely removal of waste ma'am fantastic what else sir timely removal then how should they actually remove ma'am the person who collects how should they retire be they should sign the registered uh, placed near the uh, bins or, uh, okay okay no should they wear any ppe should they transport in a uh, closed container yes yes, yes so you should be very clear about your process on what is my expectation what am i going to assess what are the risks that i go i'm going to assess in this process so you just list out the entire process on what all you would see for that particular topic that is nothing but your steps it need not be a process flow like i said now it could be different headings that you would like to see so that you want to analyze whether there are any risk in those topics do you all get me is it clear yes ma'am um could you repeat ma'am see now you know, now that you have chosen biomedical waste similarly you could choose any other topic also and when you do an audit what all do you think is important under biomedical waste or suppose you do equipment management for example if any other team is doing So, what all would you uh, would you check in an equipment management? Where all? Uh, what all would you check in an equipment management audit? You would see whether adequate equipment is available, adequate backup of power is available, alternate backup is available, whether appropriate reagents are available, whether work instruction manual is available, whether uh, people are trained how to handle the machine, right? Yes. Correct. Whether it is integrated with the HIS, whether it is throwing the correct results, how do you establish controls? So just try to list all these points, whatever you are going to check during your audit. These are all prefixed audit parameters that also can be analyzed for risk. Do you all get what I'm saying? I'm not able to see the response. I'm not able to hear the response. Also, can somebody? Sorry, sir. 
yes ma'am could be sir are they able to understand sir yes they are able to understand if someone wants to respond they have to come here and respond otherwise they won't okay, be able okay. to you won't be able fine, to hear fine. them no 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 just if somebody can just indicate because i am not able to see them also so uh, i'm totally blank from this side so it's 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 on a broader topic that you can do or on a particular topic you can drill the uh, you know drill down and then you can do a deeper uh, dive into the risk assessment also so this is the first step that you need to be doing so so far whatever we have discussed is only this first column right once you have listed okay then you we get into this failure mode causes effects etc that we will discuss now so we have already decided that we are going to have a team that is going to do to prevent the bias okay please include also subject matter experts say for example if you are going to do an uh, analysis risk analysis pertaining to equipment with all due respect to the clinicians it should not be done only by the clinician who is sitting there please try to involve the biomedical engineer also please try to involve the uh, somebody from electrical department to know whether adequate backup of the power is available for that particular equipment whether uh, ups connection is available whether they do a proper preventive maintenance for these equipments right so everything has to be uh, people who are associated with that particular topic should be involved so that your analysis is robust right so once you assemble the team and you have already finalized the topic you jot down the process you have already listed out the process so there are different ways of doing the process listing you can do a process mapping you can do this what from model you can do you can do an ishikawa you can pick steps from different models and you can just list out the topics alone and you can start doing the risk analysis now so far you have done only the listing of the process right we have described the process so now moving on to the next step identify what could go wrong at each of the process okay in the flow chart say for example receive the sample with label and trf so what all could go wrong what could go wrong why what could go wrong if that particular step is not happening what if they don't identify properly and if there is no trf what could go wrong right so it it should not be one reason in incident analysis what we normally do is we obviously know the reason why it has failed and we try to rectify that alone but when you are doing a proactive risk assessment you try to put out all the possible reasons on what could go wrong if this fails right see for example receive the sample with label and trf okay what could go wrong there may not be label there may not be trf there there could be so many other reasons on what could go wrong in, to make this particular step a failure there may not be label there may not be tab, uh, trf there may not be the patient himself right so what all could go wrong in this step should be listed it could be the stupidest reason but we need to list out each and every possibility and then only and then only we proceed on to the next so for each of these what could go wrong we need to fill why would the failure happen say for example we uh, we say that there are no labels available that's why we are not able to receive the samples with label and trf okay so why the tables may not why the labels may not be available maybe the indenting was not done properly whether the inventory is not maintained properly or they have misplaced the labels there could be so many other reasons which are not even related to your department so we are trying to identify the root end the the finest end so that if you are able to uh, establish control in each of these processes from the beginning on how you procure how do you receive the label because 
this pasting of the label is very critical for your sample receiving isn't it so you are trying to link it from the initial step till the last right so for each of these reasons you try to identify the failure causes why would the failure happen and what could happen if this fails if there are no labels if there are no trfs obviously wrong patient identification may happen leading to a wrong uh, you know diagnosis or wrong treatment leading to death of the patient or permanent disability so that's the final effect so each of these reason we need to split maybe for this particular step you will have 10 reasons you have to list out 10 reasons in 10 different rows and against each of these we have to split the failure cause the failure effect okay first you do this right only then you get into the analysis part do you all get what i'm saying it might sound little yes, complicated but if you start doing it so as a first step at least try to identify two or three critical things where it could go wrong as you you know you refine you can add more reasons you may encounter newer reasons when you actually get into the process so that is why i, I keep mentioning that you should have um, you know a proper team uh, to say what all could go wrong then you brainstorm and you list out all the possibilities and we are going to try and fix the controls so that these processes are intact right so now let's go again go ahead and do the activity now for all those steps that you have already written during the previous activity now you are going to write the failure mode cause and effect just try and attempt one or two is every team able to attempt yes ma'am yes if any of the teams have done can we discuss now camera enga thirupona neengala oh inge varingala fine neenga vandha na kavanikku so sorry good afternoon ma'am good afternoon ma'am ma'am you are going to discuss about the sample collection urine sample collection great ma'am failure mode 
பேஷண்ட் கேன் கலெக்ட் த யூரின் சாம்பிள் தான் இம்ப்ராப்பர் கண்டெய்னர் ஆர் எ லீக்கி கண்டெய்னர் வாட் இஸ் தி ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஸ்டெப் இன் தி process first step is sample collection okay so under sample collection you need to put it into minor p minor steps so under sample collection what is your first step For first we have step, to provide hmm. we have to provide a proper container to the patient excellent so issue of container is your first step in your process so what could go wrong if the container is not issued correctly patient that uh, may if a leaky container is given inadequate amount of sample may be collected excellent any other thing ma'am unsterile container it may uh, lead to the growth of other contaminants also excellent any other ma'am mislabeled container it may lead to the improper identity of the patient fantastic any other instructions we have to give proper instructions to the patient to how Excellent. to collect yes. urine yes what if the container is not adequately available in your department that also could be a failure isn't it yes so so fantastic ma'am you have identified these steps so for each of these step now you have to identify why would this happen right yes so uh, each of these steps can you elaborate what could go wrong why would the failure happen improper container it may be due to the lack of availability in our department or due to lack of knowledge that we have to give a sterile container excellent okay then what would be the effect final effect final effect we can't isolate a proper uh, positive organism so it can land up into a wrong treatment wrong patient. treatment yes. fine excellent ma'am excellent this is how for each of these reasons we need to identify why it could go wrong and what would happen why would the failure happen and what could be the overall cause overall effect on this particular step if it fails excellent ma'am thank you thank you thank you any other team wants to attempt any other team wants to attempt good afternoon ma'am good afternoon ma'am ma ma proper sample processing ma'am excellent okay that's your topic so what is the step first step ma'am uh, first uh, we should uh, check for the whether the sample is correctly uh, labeled okay and uh, patient name we have to correlate first and we have to choose an appropriate media and what test uh, we have to do okay you have listed proper all these steps have you listed yes, all these in the steps right yes ma'am can we go to that media step okay ma'am first uh, media control we have to take ma'am okay then uh, check for any ma'am where could that go wrong without media control if we put means uh, we couldn't know uh, whether we have process correctly or not okay why would that not happen sorry ma'am ma'am uh, we have to check for the lot number expiry date before preparing the media correct but why would somebody not do that checking can there be reasons for that step to be skipped Thank you.
Maybe the staff who's doing that do not know the proper techniques, may not yes, be adequately trained. Train, training to the right. personnel. So, uh, so appropriate quality media is not available. There is no SOP for that. There could be so many reasons on why this could fail. This particular step could fail, isn't it? So we need to list out all those steps. And against each of these steps, we need to say why this could go wrong, why this failure would happen, and what could be the overall effect. Right? OK, ma'am. Great attempt, ma'am. OK, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I know it's, it's a very, very... Uh, this this is a topic that is not much related to our industry. Uh, it is more to do with the automobile industry and other industries, but this is an excellent tool for the hospitals to use it. Preliminary, when you start with you initially, when you start using this tool, it will be a little difficult, but when you try and attempt, you will become very comfortable and you will be able to really see uh, what are the probable risks and where actually you need to focus? This is an excellent uh, tool that I would recommend all of you to really use in your departments. May not be 100% perfect when you are initially starting, but you can always refine the FMEA as and when you understand the concept better. Let me again share the screen. So uh, now, so far you have done the steps. You have returned you have chosen the topic after choosing the topic you have listed out the steps in each of the topic and you have identified why this could go wrong what could go wrong if this this step is not available if you skip this step what could go wrong or why would the failure happen okay why would this particular step, in this particular step, why would the failure happen? And if this failure happens and if this could go wrong, what could be the overall effect? These are the four steps that we have seen. Finally, you need to give the scores for the each of these steps. What is the likelihood of occurrence in your probability for how many patients or for how many tests or how many samples this is important based on that you give the likelihood of occurrence so in this case this is just a random number please don't say two receive samples with label and trf what is the likelihood of occurrence that a label may not be pasted what is the likelihood probability is it high or low Is it high or low? Is this step relevant to all the tests? Is this step going to influence every test that you're going to perform in your department? Yes or no? No. Are we not going to receive samples with label and TRF for every test that you are going to perform in your lab? Yes. Yes, isn't it? Every step requires, every test that you do in your department requires a sample to be received with label and TRF. Do you all agree? Is it 100%? 100% yes, So then what is the likelihood of an error happening? Is it more or less? Is it def it is definitely more the likelihood that an error could happen is very very high that's why i just put a random number here don't go by this number okay the moment you say every patient we do this the probability is definitely very very high so based on the likelihood there is a table that is already given to you according to that you give the score here okay then what is the likelihood of detection? If this error happens, what is the likelihood that you could detect? Based on that, you give the score here. So can the person who is going to receive the sample check whether the label is pasted and the TRF is available? Is it visible readily? Okay. 
see i am collecting the sample without the label and i am without the trf i am going to hand it over to the laboratory i am going to hand it over from phlebotomy i am going to hand it over to your microbiology department will the person who is receiving in the microbiology department be able to see whether there is label whether there is trf will they be able to see without any difficulty can they see or not yes yes it is very obvious right they can very well see whether it is available or not so the likelihood of detection is very very easy okay and what is the severity if this go, goes wrong if the sample is not collected with label and with without the trf what is the severity it could be high it could land up into a wrong patient wrong result leading to wrong treatment and it could land up into a death also the severity is also very high so this is how based on the matrix that is already given to you you try to keep scoring if the number of test or if the number of investigations requires every single investigation requires this step the likelihood is more the chances of an error that is going to happen is more because because every staff of yours is going to handle all this isn't it so the likelihood is going to be more detection it depends on the visibility based on that you give the detection severity if this is going to cause the patient a very real uh, you know catastrophic end then the severity is going to be high finally you multiply these three and the priority number once your risk priority number is arrived try to match that in the matrix that is given to you if it is going to be catastrophic high risk or low risk whatever it is based on that you try to prioritize you cannot solve all the problems on day 1 try to address problems which are very very critical then take it as an order right so this is how we start doing the likelihood of occurrence detection and severity and try to do the risk priority number and assign the risk level also right so there are three factors severity probability of occurrence or the likelihood and then the detection capability the severity is the consequence of the failure that may happen the probability of occurrence is the likelihood of a failure mode that is occurring and the detection rating is the ability to catch the error before causing harm to the patient right so once we have done all these things we have listed out the process we have listed the failure cause effect we know the likelihood of occurrence we have done the scoring for detection we have done the severity rating we have done the risk priority number now we need to put actions in place have you all wondered why again and again there is a cross check happening in terms of the trf or the patient label double identification why is it done at every step once the once you receive the patient they have to check the patient they have to check with the trf and then draw blood when they hand it over to the person who is going to transport it to the lab again the same person has to check whether the right sample is given right trf is taken when they hand over they again check in the lab again the person who is going to process check again the person who reports checks right why so many areas double checking is done because we are we are going to put controls in places where we have this level of risk even if one person fails in one activity if the second person could catch they could prevent a major harm to the patient that is why we normally put multiple controls in place depending on the risk levels it could be single level control it could be double level control it could be it could go up to four levels but if it if your error is going to pass through all the four levels and then reach an incident then you are rest assured that all the four levels of controls has failed and your process has miserably failed okay the near misses are nothing but one of these controls have woken up and they have prevented okay but if there are no errors that are visible you are assured that the controls are still working and 
at least one person or two controls are checking so that it is not landing up into an incident right so finally this is how we do you try to multiply the likelihood of occurrence detection and severity you arrive at the risk priority number take the actions so finally a useful tool it's a useful tool for analyzing high impact failures critical changes to workplace practice and it is not a one time exercise right you can start very very low and you can keep refining your practice as and when you start refining your process maybe you come across different failures different effects and you start updating so that your analysis becomes robust and most important would be having your controls in place it is not just enough if you have an analysis part you need to establish these controls and make sure that these are implemented in your organization only there is real uh you know that's the real purpose of doing a risk assessment the risk management is even more important than your risk assessment today we are only talking about the risk assessment post which you need to take actions like this i've given the template to you so if your risk levels are high try to put one two three four controls or at least one two three controls so that even if this particular control fails you have the second control to prevent from an incident happening right so with that we are done i know this is a very very uh, uh very dry topic and um, and it is often difficult it's a one day exercise actually so um I'm not sure how much it has reached you, but I can rest assured that this the the material that I have given shared with you will definitely be of some use to you, and you can try and attempt, and you can take my number in just in case you want to, you know, you have any clarifications. Okay. Thank you so much for patient listening. Thanks for talking. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Actually, everybody participated and. Uh... fortunately since yesterday today was the one you are the only person whom we were able to interact directly because uh, it was the first time we are do, doing like st live streaming and yesterday we were not able to interact with the speaker directly but today you made it possible you are also very insistent that you are want to uh, interact with the participants thank you so much ma'am if you are here physically we would have presented you this so thank this you. is a moment of for you ma'am so probably you can collect it when you come here for uh, assessments sure. thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you welcome back may i have dr pravin kumar sir for oral presentation sir please good evening one and all uh, my top oral presentation topic is on uh, analytical cross sectional study on uh, intestinal helminthic infestations in patients presented with uh, abdominal pain and diarrhea in my tertiary care center tanjavur second slide so 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 a little introduction on uh, geo helminths otherwise called as uh, soil transmitted helminth infestations a family of uh, intestinal parasite that will come and infect the people 
uh, when they come into touch with their uh, warm damp or warm blooded eggs or larva so as long as there remains lower socio economic status in a uh, developing country like india we are more prone to get uh, soil transmitted helminthic infestations so my aim or rationale of the study is that to detect uh, intestinal helminthic infestations uh, in patients and to check whether the implementation of deworming is done properly in all levels starting from uh, school to rural levels so my methodology is based on first we will see the specimen collection uh, totally 100 stool samples were collected four all admitted with the complaints of abdominal pain and diarrhea is nothing but the early intestinal manifestations uh, over a period of 5 months uh, since uh, march 2023 to july 2023 and all stool samples were subjected to wet mount using the normal saline and lugal sidin and uh, out of 100 samples three samples came out to be positive according uh, out of three samples one is the pinworm infestations that pinworm infestation alone is confirmed by scotch tape method next so this is the first positive sample uh, it's a 55 years uh, old woman presented with an abdominal pain and diarrhea with a known case of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus who is on regular treatment who is residing in a rural area so so second is a tenia species is 13 years old a uh, male patient presented with uh, diarrhea with a hemoglobin 10.5 g per deciliter uh, which is done in a private lab came to an opd who is studying eighth standard in nearby government school so other than this history we can't trace that uh, history for this particular patient since this case is an opd case so third one is the entrobius vermicularis uh, this case is an interesting case actually this is an antenatal patient uh, g2 p1 l1 uh, first one is a normal delivery first previous pregnancy is normal delivery and present pregnancy the gestational age corresponds to 28 weeks uh, presented with the uh, abdominal pain uh, perianal itching and uh, even that worm is coming out uh, without even straining and uh, her family members like cousin and his uh, her own brother is also affected with the same type of infestation once uh, we give the anti helminthic drugs like albendazole 400 mg stat um, every infestation is settled um, and successful successfully delivered her child so this is the just a sex wise distribution uh, totally adult male is a 46 percentage and the female 49 percentage in the school going children is a 5 percentage and uh, uh, residential wise distribution rural is 77 percentage and urban is 23 percentage so this is the test we compare i compared the anemia and the study population out of three samples came out to be positive only two samples uh, denoted to the anemic case remaining one sample is not anemic uh, remain one patient is not anemic uh, out of uh, negative samples uh, 37 patients are uh, anemic and uh, 60 patients are not anemic so this is uh, just age wise distribution Uh, less than 10 years i can't collect the samples since the nobody admitted at the time with a diarrhea and abdominal pain uh, 11 to 20 years the eight samples 21 to 30 years 19 the uh, 31 to 40 is the maximum numbers 25 participants 25 samples 25 patients and 41 to 50 is a 15 51 to 60 15 and uh, 61 and more than 70 overall is 18 patients so the overall prevalence of uh, geo helminthic infestations among patients in this study was 3 percentage and but the prevalence of school going children and young adolescents the 12.5 and 5.26 percentage respectively so according to who uh, we have to uh, keep this percentage less than 2 percentage by the year of 2030 so we are almost on reach it's now the 3 percentage so my prevalence rate was found to be almost similar to the studies done in india by pugalendi chandra babu and mr gobala krishnan ananda ishwar and the factors found to be uh, significantly associated with uh, geo helminthic infestations isolated in my study 
were mostly the patients residing in rural areas and used pipe water. So to avoid that, chlorine treated water is the best way to overcome this obstacle. So my novelty of the study is that uh, interventional intervention by from our side is that uh, health education to school children and even to their parents about their uh, various uh, personal uh, environmental hygienic practices such as uh, proper hand washing, waste disposal and balanced diet and periodic deworming and along with its importance to be provided. So these are all my refer. Yes ma'am, for three cases I did. Sorry, two cases ma'am. For one case I didn't uh, intervene. Since it's the OPD case, we can't trace ma'am. School, school do me. Previous, previous. No, no ma'am. No, no, I didn't conduct it. It's like. So my references are uh, KD Chatterjee, uh, Parasitol 13th edition and uh, all of the three journals done in Trivandrum and uh, Panchipuram district and North Ethiopia. Thank you. So, ma'am, I just followed that uh, first and third case, ma'am. That hookworm case, I followed that patient recovered nicely. And for intrabase vermicularis case, I followed the family itself, and that family is also recovered nicely, ma'am. For second case, since it's the OPD case, we didn't follow, ma'am. We can't trace that uh, case, ma'am. No, no blood run, no history of blood transfusion. Even in current pregnancy or in previous pregnancy also, there is no blood transfusion. What is the significance of the question, ma'am? Uh, any, what, why are you asking about transfusion? Any? That is entropy vermicularis. Okay, any relation, ma'am? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Who quam? I can't, I can't hear. Yes, who can patient? Uh, there is no blood. No, ma'am. No, it don't. It's Stephanie Mia. School study is okay. Okay, ma'am. Awareness program. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Now, this hour session is going to engage by Dr. Diego Edwin, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, Consultant Clinical Microbiologist, and Infection Control Officer of Trishi SRM Medical College and Hospital. Sir did his undergraduation in Raja Muthiya Medical College and post graduation in Mahatma Gandhi Medical College Hospital and Research Center. Sir has attended and organized many training programs and workshops like Unicora. He has published many research papers and poster, poster presentation. Sir has also conducted various awareness programs and guest lectures, including antibiotic resistance and awareness on COVID pandemic and so on. His areas of expertise are clinical microbiology services and hospital acquired infection control and surveillance program. May I request Dr. Diego Edwin, sir, to talk about NABL 2022 and update. Thank you, sir. <coughs> So, good afternoon, everyone. Since yesterday, we have been talking about quality and many parts of it. We have been exploring, we have been doing workshops, we have been doing a lot of things, we have been discussing a lot of things. But uh, it takes quite a while to understand exactly what is quality only when you start practicing it. So, as we already know, quality is a continuous improvement process. We use the we have used we have been using the word quality since our childhood. Yes, when we when we went to the toy shop to get a toy, is it a quality and a toy? Is this of good quality? This is the question we ask. But the real question to ask is 
we cannot uh, use this word quality as an adjective to any product or a material but whereas we can use this adjective use the word quality as an adjective to any brand or companies whether this brand has quality whether do they maintain quality does this company maintain quality which is do they make efforts to identify and criticize themselves identify the mistakes and make continuous improvements and efforts to improve and maintain the quality there are many definitions for quality from my point of view i have understood one thing there are two words in english first one we call accuracy can someone tell me what is accuracy accuracy is like if you take a gun and if you are able to shoot it in the center of the bull's eye that is called as accuracy but if you do it once it is called as accuracy but supposedly i give you 10 chances out of 10 how many times are you accurately able to hit the same center spot that is called as precision exactly so even in trichy there is one uh, microbiology lab which is named as precision which means what they intend to say is what they intend to say is we are able to give you the same quality of reports all the time so quality is always measurable precision is measurable so there is 90% precision there is 80% precision there is 100% precision that is how we quantify accuracy or precision so to put it in simple terms you have understood what is quality okay so my talk my topic is update nabl update 2022 <coughs> for you to understand this you should be able you should be familiar with the iso 15189 2012 so nabl is the only uh, quality accreditation council that has we have been talking about since the beginning of that since the dawn of the pandemic but there are many other quality accreditation councils quality quality council of india nabh nabl there are many quality accreditations does nabl alone does not mean quality or nabh alone does not mean quality quality means quality there are there are only accreditation bodies which can give you a certificate that you are maintaining qualities when it comes to any accreditation bodies they will never give you standard guidelines have you ever seen nabl or nabh saying uh, if you are going to have a molecular lab it should be of this size it needs certain amount of square feet certain amount of walking space it must have air conditioning does it say anything no the only term if you see in the entire document of iso 15189 2012 would be adequate convenient necessary so basically the entire document means common sense and practicality yes there is a way please take this home with you do not go and ask anyone if you're going to go for accreditation for any lab no you need not go and ask anyone ma'am idu eppadi pannu idu evlo space venu idu ipdi venuma apdi venuma you don't have to ask anyone just use your common sense and it will be fine or better yet experimentation trial and error method you start doing once see hold on to a standard hold on to a standard try to implement something with whatever money you have whatever infrastructure you have when infa implement this when there are mistakes identify it correct it improve again it goes a while there will be mistakes criticize yourself identify it improve then come to a standard so slowly slowly you can improve so that is how it comes you need not go and ask around ebdi pannano ebdi pannano how to do it how much is needed you need not ask at all all we have to do is use our common sense and make sure that it is practical and it is productive quality is never about perfection you can never chase perfection if you start chasing perfection it is an, you will never achieve it but instead try to focus on productivity It's huge difference between the both when you strive for perfection you all always get too stressed and tensed and suddenly there is a lot of hurt and ego hurt so many things are coming like that so always focus on productivity and quality can never be achieved as a one man show it is always a team work so when it comes to a, for example if it is our lab in our hospital every employee in our laboratory right from the hod head to the tail hod to the housekeeping staff to the assistant professor to the pgs technicians everybody must know what to do what they are doing everybody must have a role to play and everybody must play that role perfectly it is always a team effort when one person is not up to the mark other people have to actually try to pull him up and bring everyone to the same level of involvement 
also of course management's involvement must be there everything everybody must be involved and it is never ipo vandu munadi vandu when you come to see when you see iso 15189 there was one person called as quality manager epoyume nam lab la ellarume we will be asking for quality man adu see whatever you whatever uh, ncs or whatever criticism you point out someone points out we will say adu quality manager paathuvaanga adu avangaloda vela its quality manager's job but it enable 2022 or one iso 15189 2022 the document says says otherwise there need not be a single quality manager everything has to be decentralized and responsibilities must be given to all the personnel working in the laboratory if a technician is doing a job turn around time register something has to be maintained it, it does not mean that the quality manager has to maintain the document she can maintain the document or he can maintain the document sample collection register critical alerts whatever it is it need completely decentralized it give it to each one person whoever is directly dealing with it so this is what basically enable uh, i mean 2022 update says iso 1489 see this document has around 175 slides but of course i'm not going to present the whole thing i'll be finishing it off as 20 or 25 slides i'm just going to tell you the difference between both the documents all right so this Uh, the entire uh, 15189 2022 document i have made it as a ppt i'll be posting it in the group and already posted it in the group if you have seen so you can take this home and you can keep this with you it is very uh, understanding qual iso 151989 is very very simple all you have to do is sit down and read the document do not see do not look at, look at the index and turn to one page and try to read one page alone from the beginning to the end if you have read the booklet completely you will understand how to implement things all right so let's go into the topic <clears throat> next slide please okay so this transition from iso 15189 from 2012 to 2022 is for the foundation of quality india faculty see this is a teaching academy where i am also a part of i am also a faculty of this part time faculty visiting faculty of this foundation of quality india so our mission is to go out and teach about quality to every nook and corner of india so that we can improve the quality of our country as a whole when it comes to lab medicine okay so this presentation is based on the contents of 15189 2022 it is re- released and it was released in december 2022 okay so this document cannot be used by any organization to develop or check the implementation of contents of this document next slide please next slide okay so this is based on a structure resource process and outcome so let's if you understand english only because english is a foreign language to us we struggle with this book seriously no matter how no matter how much mbbs or md we have studied in english no matter how much we have studied our school in english it is still a foreign language to us it is not our mother tongue we can speak fluently but we may not understand the depth of it purely because it is not our mother tongue so we if you if you analyze and understand each and sing each and every single word of this document it is very it becomes very very easy for you structure refers to resources processes refers to operations and activities and outcome refers to output or the product that is result next slide so these are the changes in the requirements for medical laboratory when it comes to quality and competence so the main changes are as follows the alignment with the original mother document that is iso/iec 17025 2017 resulted in the management requirements now appearing at the end of the document requirements for point of care testing previously in iso 2020 uh, 22870 have been incorporated an increased emphasis on risk management and that is the topic that we had earlier today which was given by mrs suda next slide so the format of this document is based on the mother document iso iec 17025 2017 next slide next slide so let me give you some background information about iso 15189 so iso slash iec 17025 was first issued in 1999 by international organization for standardization that is what it abbreviates to iso and international electrotechnical commission which is iec it underwent just a minor revision in 2005 it is the single most important standard for calibration and testing of laboratories 
around the world with more than 50000 laboratories accredited globally the standard iso iec 17025 third edition 2017 is launched on 29 11 2017 so this iso 1518 is completely based on this next casco is the iso committee that works on issues relating to conformity assessment casco develops policy and publishes standards related to conformity assessment there are no significant technical changes in new standard and presently compliant laboratories are unlikely to have any significant issues with the new standard so there are no major changes in the document only it has been rearranged retermed re and uh, importance have been slightly given here and there the priorities are changed but the content remains the same so the biggest difference is the structure of the standard which is completely revised having distinguished resource from process and acknowledging the role of iso 9001 based management system next slide so this is the structure of cosco it is not very clear so i don't want to talk about this okay next slide please this document was prepared by the iso committee on conformity assessment and circulated for voting to the national bodies of both iso and iec and was approved by both organization this third edition cancels and replaces the second edition that is iso iec 17025 2005 so the latest is 2017 next why was it revised the last version of iso iec, uh, iec 17025 was published in 2005 and since then market conditions and technology have changed the new version covers technical changes vocabulary developments in it techniques it also takes into consideration the latest version of iso 9001 the key changes are it takes into consideration the new ways of working of laboratories today because just rewind back 10 years ago most of the laboratories did not have a, a system most of the laboratories did not have a laboratory information system many medical colleges did not have a hospital information system which was integrated with lis but now it has become mandatory because data collection is absolutely important surveillance is absolutely important of course we need data for improvement we need to know exactly what is happening here so that we can improve the scope has been revised to cover all laboratory activities including testing calibration and the sampling associated with subsequent calibration and testing next a new structure has been adopted to adopted to align the standard with other existing conformities assessment standards such as iso 17000 series on conformity assessment the process approach now matches that of newer standards such as iso 9001 which is quality management and iso 15189 quality of medical laboratories and the iso 17000 series which stands for standards for conformity assessment activities putting the emphasis on results of a process instead of detailed description of its tasks and steps next the standard has a stronger focus on information technologies in recognition of the fact that hard copy manuals records and reports are slowly being phased out in favor of electronic versions it incorporates the use of computer systems electronic records and production of electronic results and reports a new section has been added introducing the concept of risk based thinking and describes the commonalities with newer version of iso 9001 2015 quality management system requirements so if someone asks you what is the difference or what is the update of nabl 2022 or iso 15189 in 2022 you can simply say risk management and risk assessment has been given much more importance it has been prioritized the terminology has been updated examples include changes to the international vocal, uh, vocabulary uh, vocabulary of metrology and alignment with iso terminology which has set a, which has a set of common terms and definitions for all standards dedicated to conformity assessment next slide the main changes compared to the previous edition are as follows the risk based thinking application in this edition has enabled some reduction in prescriptive requirements and the replacement by performance based requirements so when you are going to face an assessment they are not going to go into the details of exactly step by step what is happening all they are going to look at is the productivity because whatever plan or whatever 
infrastructure you are, that you are going to implement here everything will be directly reflecting on the productivity or the result there is greater flexibility than in previous edition in the requirements for processes procedures documented information and organizational responsibilities organizational responsibilities that was what i was talking about there is no more one single quality manager everybody can be quality managers each and every individual can be assigned a certain documentation and task and they are responsible for their own set of work then a definition of a laboratory has been added if you see the document or if you see the ppt you will be knowing this next slide okay in this international standards see if you take the picture of the slide or if you have a mental picture of this slide it is very very easy for you to understand this document wherever this document says uses the word shall it means that it is a requirement it is mandatory if in the shall abdi nor vishayam potu or vishayam irukku abdina if there is something indicated with the letter uh, word shall it is a requirement which is absolutely mandatory and wherever they use the word should it indicates a recommendation and wherever it gives the word may it indicates permission for example the laboratory may collect sample from the external collection center so in the mari may if they use the word may it is a permission that they are giving the laboratory may use the nabl symbol in their report form or requisition form then it is a permission and when they say can it indicates the possibility or the capability which means the lab can perform molecular biology tests which means the lab has molecular bi biology tests the lab can transport samples from the collection center to the hospital idella vand lab oda capabilities so all these things are mentioned so remember these four terms shall should may and can so whenever you are going to implement or when you are working towards accreditation for your institution when you are reading this document wherever there is shall it is a requirement wherever there is should it is a recommendation wherever there is may the uh, accreditation body is giving you permission and whenever there is can it indicates that it is publicizing your capability the lab's capability next slide the risk based thinking applied in this edition has enabled Uh, this i uh, think is already done next next slide previously next next okay this is one big question whom to approach for accreditation when a laboratory seeks accreditation it should be it should select an accreditation body you are going to select an accreditation body whether it is nabl or nabh i mean when it comes to lab there is not any base there is quality council of india there are many other accreditation bodies which so you have to select one accreditation body which operates in accordance with iso iac 170112017 2017 just like you are going to have a selection process when you are buying instruments or equipments just like you are going to have a selection process or an interview when you are hiring people this you can also do this nabl is not the only accreditation body in india you can go around and shop for accreditation bodies whatever it is the payment or their requirements everything you can take a look at and then whatever is suitable for you you can go in for accreditation so the only condition is that it has to whatever accreditation body that you are choosing it has to operate in accordance with iso iac 1700 2017 as on date in india we have nabl and qai these are the two accreditation bodies in india which operates in accordance with this number next so comparisons between this document iso 9001 2015 and iso 17025 2017 are in annex b in the ppt you can see the comparison of iso 15189 2012 to this document is in annex c so you have a detailed comparison a tabular column put whatever changes are made it's all just rearrangements next uniqueness of 2022 document this contains requirements for the medical laboratory to plan and implement actions to address risks and opportunities for improvement idu da vandu uniqueness next number of definitions in this document are 32 instead of 37 <clears throat> 
the requirements of risk management are alignment aligned with the principles of iso 22367 the requirements of laboratory safety are aligned with the principles of iso 15190 the requirements of sample collection and transport are aligned with iso 20658.1 next so the requirements for risk management are aligned with principles of iso 22367 and requirements for laboratory safety are aligned with the principles of iso 15190 next this document contains the requirements of point of care testing and super seeds iso 22870 which is withdrawn upon publication of this document next okay so from this it goes on and on you we have to read off all the 175 slides evlo slides mudinjirukku okay as i said 25 slides are over so if you go on on and on and on and on another five or six slides there will be it will be pointing out the whatever has been updated in enable 2022 document or iso 15189 but as you go for, go on further it I actually gets into the main document 15189 2022 so you can have this document for your reference i hope you are clear with how to read the document all you have to do is sit and read you cannot read it in one day you have to spend a week or so you have to read and discuss among your uh, faculties then it will be very very easy for you to understand you need not go for a consultant or any consultancy or you need not call up and ask sir what to do how to do where to do okay if you have any doubts you can interact with me I guess no. Okay, thank you. um we are nearing the end of the sessions i'm sure um, still all of you are is a greek and latin right i am sure we have just ignited the interest in you to go and look back uh, into what quality is and wherever possible you can apply okay so for like why or gram strain panninganalo adukku quality na enna pannano eppadi pannano abdinu kettu therinjikonga it's not possible uh, in these two days to completely train you to become experts in quality okay only we can just ignite the desire for you to go back and do things uh, as perfect as possible and uh, as all the speakers have uh, highlighted there are always uh, documents and uh, sops to guide you on how to maintain quality for any particular uh, thing be it academic or in the laboratory you have to um, maintain an attendance then what is the standard operating procedure for them if you have to a performer afb staining test so it was discussed so much here so for that you have a sop so you go back look into what sops you have most important is seiyrada sollunga solrada seiyinga ellame correct a paper la irukkaan paarenga evidence irukkaan paarenga so this is the very basic thing i i hope you will go back and then you will realize slowly how uh, important this i don't think these are all available in your books so whatever you have learned today i'm sure it will be useful to you thank you and we have one more uh, thank you ma'am may i now request dr arshit first year post graduate department of ortho to deliver a oral presentation samail <laughs> konchari
Um, good afternoon one and all uh, my press oral presentation was today is based on uh, fungal osteomyelitis next like uh, introduction the fungal osteomyelitis it's a very uncommon form of osteomyelitis that uh, usually occurs often with the pyogenic infestation of musculoskeletal system uh, musculoskeletal infestation was directly from the inoculation contagious from the hematogenous spread and the most common cause of organism includes uh, candida species like candida albigens and uh, aspergillus and uh, rarely histoplasma species and uh, blastomyces and cryptococcus and sporotrichs next slide Medi methods and materials this is a retrospective study that is a collection of data from the various tamil nadu medical colleges from the 2018 to 2022 with a minimum follow up period of 19 months it was a time it was this time uh, that the indiscriminate and uh, rampant use of steroid was in use uh, in the covid conditions next next um inclusion criteria we included a, a male and female patient of all age groups and musculoskeletal infection of all joints uh, bones including the vertebra with or without the concomitant pyogenic infections um the exclusion criteria the patients who have had organ transplantation were already on immunosuppressive drug hiv patients patients on a long term of steroid use in case of rheumatoid arthritis and sarcoidosis next slide mm, the cal the my first presentation was first based case was candida albigens vertebral osteomyelitis uh, 27 years old male came with complaints of uh, progressive lower back pain for 5 months with pain radiating to left lower hip uh no history of trauma was present on palpation the tenderness was present over in the lower region l4 l5 region we have taken the x-ray and the x-ray shows the lytic lesion over the l4 l5 region and mri was done in doubtful of uh, any case of infection mri shown l4 l5 discitis with osteomyelitic changes um next slide um this is where the mri we can able to see the l4 l5 vertebra in between the l4 l5 l5 disc we can see the discitis presentation with uh, compression over the spinal cord spinal cord compression was present and uh, we have uh, done the biopsy from the infected site biopsy shows the culture was sent and the culture was shown uh, for a candida albigens the species shows a white colored smooth and yeast like appearance the patient was treated on uh, empirical uh, amphotericin b and fluconazole upon complaints of uh, renal impairment the patient was shifted for four weeks of fluconazole and the follow up in the follow up period the patient has no complaints over the lower back pain next case next and my next case was aspergillus vertebral osteomyelitis in this case a 30 years old uh, 30 years old uh, male present with complaints of a uh, lower back pain for 9 months which was dull aching type of pain with the pain radiating to left uh, the whole lower limb and the tenderness was present at the lower back pain no neurological deficit was present no history of trauma was seen um he had history of uh, fever on and off with the loss of weight for uh, around 6 kg the x-ray was done and revealed it was a light lesion over the l4 l5 lesion on doubtful we have done the mri uh, less pain with the whole spine screening and the screening shows l4 l5 destructions of the vertebra with the uh, cauda equina compression was present mm, after that uh, the patient was underwent l4 l5 discectomy posterior instrumentation was done and the graft inter body fusion with the graft was taken from the iliac crest next slide next slide uh this is the posterior instrumentation for the l4 l5 ha munadi avalla munadi please 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 ha okay illa illa please adutha adutha next slide next slide am illa next slide next slide illa sir pinadi 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 illa Well, the biopsy was taken and the, the patient was sent for histopathology examination. Numerous fungal profiles were seen in the granulation tissue. 
which was a septate showed acute angle branching were highlighted by no, which was showed uh, uh, by uh, Gomeri Metaminstein. The patient was started on itraconazole 200 mg twice a day for three months. At one year follow up, the patient was uh, free of all the symptoms and uh, no complaints of back pain. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, the third presentation was uh, histoplasma capsulatum osteomyelitis. In this case, we have a 31 years old male with the complaints of uh, pain over the left wrist region, no history of trauma, no history of uh, neurological impairment was present, no history of uh, fever chills. On examination, the wrist, uh, left wrist tenderness was present, no restriction of movement was there, um, uh, but the no palpable mass, new neuro neurological deficit was present. Uh, a routine lab investigation was done, which was uh, 4,000. 4200 cc WBC cells and the x ray was shown uh, left demonstrated lesion over the lateral aspect of the left wrist the, in the epiphysis region with the sharp borders mm, with the mild cortical thinning. The lesion demonstrated is particularly sclerotic margins. And this is the x ray. We can see that the distal part of the radius has lytic lesions, which is a radial lesion. We can see it in the x ray. And the you know, open biopsy was performed. Open biopsy was performed on that region, uh, and histopathological examination was done, uh, which shows a small budding yeast with the eccentric acorn, acorn-like nuclei clustered with histocytes findings, which are diagnosed of fungal osteomyelitis. Next, next. Hmm. Okay. 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 The patient initially managed with the uh, intravenous amphotericin B with the uh, oral itraconazole, but the uh, renal impairment was present as the drug was intake, and uh, so the amphotericin B was discontinued, and oral itraconazole is followed up for 12 months, and the patient was regularly followed up, and there is no complaint, and the symptoms is progress progressively reduced. Uh, discussion. Despite fungi being a perceptive microorganism, only about 200 species are pathogenic to humans, with uh, about a dozen causing 90% of the human mycosis. The rampant and discriminate use of steroid in, bio, in COVID pandemic could have been a contributory factors in the risk of uh, number of patients presenting with a varied form of musculoskeletal fungal infections. It is often overlooked when contemplating on the differential diagnosis of musculoskeletal pathologies, which leads to substantial delay in the initiation of treatment and affecting the prognosis. Conclusive, the rampant and discriminate steroids should be discouraged. It is necessary for treating orthopedic surgeon to keep at the rear of their mind the fungal causes of the musculoskeletal pathologies. Unless high degree of suspicion is maintained, especially in those who have had the steroids for a significant amount of time, now identifying the costly organism and initiation of appropriate treatment in the initial stage may give a, a early treatment and a, that cause irreversible damage to the affecting bones or joints. Thank you. Huh? It needs biopsy. Oh, no. One sample only we have sent. Only one sample in that lab we have sent. For each cases we have sent one sample. Okay. Thank you, sir. May I now request Dr. Chitra Radhalakshmi, ma'am, organizing chairperson of Unicora, professor and aide, Department of Microbiology, to honor our delegate speaker, Dr. Diaho Edwin, sir, with a memento. Thank you. 
May I call upon Dr. Praveen Kumar, sir, for his oral presentation to collect the certificates. May I also call upon Dr. Arshid, sir, to get his certificate. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. If a man wants to read good books, he must have to avoid some books since life is short and time with energy limited. Now I invite Dr. Anita, ma'am, Organizing Secretary of Unicora 2023, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, to deliver closing remarks. Ma'am, please. Yes, it was a very long brainstorming session. I think uh, everyone of you have uh, benefited from our Unicora 2023. We took quality as a topic because it is upcoming field and everyone will be having so many doubts regarding it. And uh, we have called eminent speakers who elaborated us on and enlightened us regarding the topics. Yes. Uh, so thank you on once again for every uh, all the participants who have come offline and online to all my uh, organizing team members who have actively participated and all the supporting staffs for uh, supporting us. And um, I also th thank the management people who supported us and our chairman especially who has supported, uh, given a great hand and support to us for conducting this event. And we'll be conducting soon. Uh, we look forward for same interesting and upcoming field in Unicora 2024 also will be seeing and inviting you yes once again thank you all thank you ma'am i would like to quote the words of mot man man who does does not read the books has no advantages over the one who can't read them finally we conclude this unicora 2023 with the national anthem let us all stand for the national anthem 